Great. So hello, everyone. Um, we are fortunate to have people joining us from across multiple time zones today. And so I will say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for taking the time to be with us. My name is Belinda Glenn, and I'm the Communications Advisor uh, with USAID's Vukanao Activity. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the first Vukanao Media Roundtable, a series of events which are intended to share information with the media about the work being done to combat wildlife crime, predominantly in Southern Africa. As you know, today's event is specifically focusing on pangolins as we build up to World Pangolin Day on Saturday. And so not only do I welcome our colleagues from the media, but also many other stakeholders who have an interest in these special animals. Before we get started, I would just like to share the agenda with you and take you through a few housekeeping rules. In a moment, we'll hear from USAID Southern Africa's Acting Mission Director, and Vukanao's chief of party before we hand over to our esteemed panel of speakers. There'll then be time for a few questions after the panel discussion before we close the event. In terms of housekeeping, uh, just to let you know that this event is being recorded um, and snippets of the recording may be shared on social media. So please be sure to keep your microphones muted throughout the event unless you are speaking. If you have accidentally unmuted yourself, you might find that I or one of my colleagues may mute your microphone for you. Please don't be offended. Um, we're just trying to ensure that there's no background noise or distractions while everyone's discussing. Um, because there's so many of us today, as I already mentioned, we won't have time for everyone to introduce themselves, but we do encourage you to type your name as well as your media outlet or organization that you're representing into the chat function um, so that we have a sense of who's on the call with us. You can find the chat function at the bottom of your screen if you haven't found it already, and it's to the right of the participants button. Please also feel free to type in any questions for the speakers into the chat during the panel discussion, and we'll try our best to include them in the conversation. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Rebecca Kashivda, sorry, USAID Southern Africa's Acting Mission Director. Rebecca has worked for USAID since 1999 and joined USAID Southern Africa in August 2016. Prior to that, she worked in USAID missions in the Philippines, Nigeria, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Serbia, and Pakistan. Rebecca has a bachelor's degree in business and a master's degree in accounting from the George Washington University in Washington, DC. She is a certified public accountant, and I know she is also passionate about the work being done to combat wildlife crime in Southern Africa. And so without further ado, I hand over to her. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. It is really exciting to join everyone, uh, I'm, especially on behalf of the United States government to mark the celebration of the World Pangolin Day. I know it's normally the third Saturday of a Friday and so we are excited to be able to start this off really together. It's such an important animal and it's such an important issue. So we really are excited to really call attention to the plight and the issues around this region. Across all of Southern Africa, wildlife is an important cultural, economic asset, and it contributes to sustaining the livelihoods of millions of people. However, we all know that many wildlife is under really a tremendous threat, rhinos, elephants, and yes, pangolins. And we wanna make sure that we can do whatever we can do to support them. Illegal wildlife trade and other forms of organized crime really have a tremendous threat on economic development. They undermine global and regional security and also legitimate economies. So that's why it is so important that we work together. We know that it's a transnational issue and it thrives on weak governance and corruption. And so with that, we need to make sure that we work across borders, addressing it with international and regional cooperation. When we lose security, and wildlife as a result of illegal wildlife trade, we also lose a lot of tools to strengthen rule of law and fighting poverty. 
USAID considers this so important, we consider this a real development challenge. And for nearly a decade, wildlife poaching and trafficking have been viewed as a conservation crisis, demanding urgent responses from government, NGOs, private sector, and the communities. So in 2017, we launched a five-year, 62 million portfolio of activities designed to combat wildlife crime across Southern Africa region. The portfolio includes of six activities operating across eight countries, and it seeks to strengthen law enforcement and legal frameworks to enhance the cooperation and coordination at both the national and regional levels. USAID VUCA Now activity, our host for the roundtable today, which we are so appreciative of, is a really important part of this portfolio, working to promote learning, capacity building, and sharing of information on best practices to enhance coordination. And through these activities, USA partners with government institutions, civil society, and private sector to develop and implement strategies to tackle this. We know we can't do it alone and not one of us has the solution. But why are we discussing penguins today? We know that there are other species. When you think of poaching, you think of rhinos, you think of elephants. And indeed, that is very true. Rhino horn is one of the most prominent and highly valued valued products in the legal wildlife train, as is ivory. But we want to make sure that everyone is aware that pangolins, and there's eight species of them, is actually the most heavily trafficked mammal in the world. In fact, more than one million pangolins are estimated to have been poached in the last decades for their meat and their scales. Many people think of pangolins as reptiles because of their scales, but really they are actually mammals. Uh, they're found in Africa and in Asia, and they are insectivores. They can really adapt to a wide range of um, food, mostly of ants and termites. And they have a very long tongue that can reach deep into the insect mans to extract their food. So as a result, penguins are a really vital part of the uh, ecosystem. They control insect populations and improve soil quality. Some say that an, one adult pangolin can consume up to 70 million insects in a year. Despite its scarily armor and elusive nature, I know I, for one, have not seen one when I have gone on safaris. When they are frightened, they will curl up into a tight ball to protect its underbelly, making it a very, very easy target for poachers. And historically, uh, they haven't received a lot of conservation attention. This has started to change due to the higher profile of the species and more dubiously in their possible links to the global coronavirus pandemic. You'll hear about that more shortly from our panel of experts and the evidence is very complicated, but we do know the link between animals and diseases from HIV to Ebola to SARS to MERS and COVID-19. It's extraordinarily complex and increasingly important for public health officials, policymakers, and yes, journalists like yourselves. Journalists working in all forms of media, print, broadcast, digital, have critical roles in playing really to uncover the legal wildlife trade and its intersections with other issues of broad public concern like public health. We really appreciate any time you raise awareness, whether it's about the species that's being poached or about the people involved, we know it's complicated and the peoples whose security, livelihoods, and well-being are threatened by this illegal trade. Your help to increase transparency and accountability against government policy really is important, and we appreciate it. We appreciate when you conduct investigative reporting, and through responsible journalism, you really contrib contribute meaningful to the creation of really informed citizens, um, increased demand for accountability, and we would also like to thank everybody for the increased role that media has played to fight COVID-19. We all know how important information is and how hard misinformation is to address. And we appreciate everybody fighting the fight against COVID-19. And we know that media outlets have been impacted. We know that many journalists personally have been impacted. We know that budgets have been reduced and revenue may be down. And so we really appreciate and are very grateful for the journalists, journalist students who have taken the time to join this webinar today. We know how busy you are and how uh, important it is to do this. 
So we really thank everyone for your active participation and I wish you the best in your future reporting. Thank you so very much. Fantastic, thank you so much, Rebecca. I really appreciate those words. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I would now like to introduce, if I can get the next slide to come on, <laughs> Deborah Kahatano, who is our Chief of Party for USAID's Vukanao activity. Deborah is an ecologist with vast experience in the field of conservation, natural resource management, and tourism development in Eastern and Southern Africa. Prior to joining Vukanao, she was working for the SADC Secretariat as the Senior Program Officer responsible for natural resources and wildlife. She is passionate about transfrontier conservation areas and has been involved in different aspects of transboundary natural resource management for more than a decade. Over to you, Deborah. Thank you so much, uh, Belinda. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on your geographical location. I'm going to give a brief presentation of Vukanao activity in order to provide a context to today's event. But before I do that, uh, let me acknowledge the presence of the Acti Acti Acting Mission Director for USAID, as well as other USAID representatives that are here in this webinar. I acknowledge the representatives of SADC member states here present, the media houses that are here with us. I'm acknowledging our combating wildlife crime landscape partners, the conservation agencies, and all other collaborating partners that are in attendance. I thank you for taking time out of your busy calendar to participate in this event. As mentioned by the Acting Mission Director, VUCA now is a part of a portfolio of programs in combat to combat wildlife crime in Southern Africa that are being supported by USAID Southern Africa. The objective or the goal of VUCA now is to support a shared commitment of the uh, United States government, SADC member states, private sector partners, as well as civil society to significantly decrease wildlife crime across the region. As we all know, uh, wildlife crime is a serious challenge in the region and in the globe at large, as it robs the custodians of our biological capital, meaning our governments and communities of legitimate economic benefits while benefiting or enriching organized wildlife crime, wildlife uh, crime syndicates. So we have two objectives that we are trying to achieve under the open activity. The first one is to catalyze learning and sharing for improved results to combat wildlife crime. And the second objective is to increase collaborative action to reduce wildlife crime in targeted areas. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, let me give a quick snapshot of a uh, portfolio of USAID combating wildlife crime in the region. Uh, USAID is supporting uh, different activities that are implemented by different partners. And these are cutting across three transfrontier conservation areas, which is uh, Malawi, Zambia, Kabango, Zambezi, and Great Lipopo Transfrontier Conservation Area. In the area of Kaza in Northwestern Namibia, we have uh, WWF Namibia in partnership with WWF US. Uh, they're implementing an activity combating wildlife crime in Namibia and Kaza area. Then in Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area, there is a partnership of three uh, different um, institutions that are implementing activities. We have a CETA program, which is being implemented by the WWF South Africa. There is activities to support communities and law enforcement against poaching in the Southeast Law Field and Southwest Law Field. And these are being implemented by Sustainable Agriculture Technology as well as Lower Felt Rhino Trust. Then in Malawi, Zambia, uh, IFAO uh, is the main partner in terms of uh, implementing a combating wildlife crime activity in Malawi, Zambia transboundary landscape. And as mentioned earlier, VUCA now is a complementary activity that supports learning across these landscape partners and as well as across other organizations in the region that are working towards combating wildlife crime facilitate learning, sharing of experiences, and also other experiences and, um, and other objectives that are critical to combating wildlife crime. So in terms of our approach, uh, VUCA now is uh, mainly focusing on catalyzing learning and knowledge sharing, uh, focusing, as I said, in these landscape partners under the USA Southern Africa portfolio of activities, but we are also working with other relevant stakeholders in the region with the similar objectives as ours. We are supporting collaborative action to combat wildlife crime. And this is mainly supporting the implementation of the static law enforcement and poaching strategy, because this is the framework, regional framework 
for combating wildlife crime and illegal wildlife trade that the SADC member states have agreed to collaborate on. So this one provides a framework of collaboration. So we are supporting the countries to implement uh, the SADC law enforcement and under reporting strategy. But we are also supporting other novel and innovative approaches to combating wildlife crime, issues around technology and tools that are necessary to support um, this um, a war against uh, wildlife crime. We are supporting forensic investigation as a critical tool to ensure successful um, cases um, of wildlife crime. We are also supporting investigative reporting and accurate reporting of wildlife crime. And that's where we're working with media in this regard. But we also have a grant uh, facility whereby we provide small grants to different institutions in the region to accelerate specific and targeted interventions that address wildlife crime in different areas. And in this case, we also support some activities that are geared towards community engagement. But we also leverage partnership opportunities with private sector to ensure that we increase our efforts to combat wildlife crime in the region. Next. So uh, VUCA now implements a lot of activities, as I said, but today I'm going to focus mainly on the media engagement because that's the reason we're here under this media roundtable to uh, collaborate at the World Pangolin Day, building up towards that day. So under objective two of VUCA now, which is to increase collaborative action to reduce wildlife crime in targeted area, we have an activity or expected result, which is improved transparency and reporting on wildlife crime. That is where we're working mainly with media and journalists to support uh, these activities. And most of the thing, typical activities that we support under this uh, uh, intermediate result is to supporting, uh, collaborating or commemorating wildlife and conservation days, like the World Pangolin Day. And this event today is built up towards the World Pangolin Day on Saturday. But we are using these opportunities as these activities, uh, these events as opportunities to raise the awareness, not only to media, but to the entire community about conservation and wildlife crime and different plight to these species. We are also organizing different uh, media roundtable discussions to foster a community of practice uh, for, wildlife crime, um, for wildlife crime journalists. We are also providing resources such as a wildlife, uh, wildlife crime reporting tool, which is being, uh, is being developed at the moment to support journalists to report effectively on wildlife crime. But also we have different avenues to support skill development for journalists uh, on improved techniques and methods in wildlife crime reporting. And still in the media event, of course, uh, as you're aware, we are on this uh, event today uh, to discuss, um, to increase understanding of media on the conservation status of pangolin and the peril of illegal wildlife trade that it poses with the pangolins by hearing from the experts who are working to, uh, to save and conserve these animals. And we hope this will assist in terms of raising awareness of the issues and uh, what we can do to protect these species. But in addition, we do have some uh, opportunities for learning. We do have an online platform for learning. We call it eVocalearn. And under this eVocalearn, there are a number of courses that are, are being offered. But we have a, a, um, a free library, learning library, uh, on combating wildlife crime as a journalist. And this is a very exciting uh, course. It's self-paced, so you can take it at your own time. And it offers tips and ideas um, that you can use when you are reporting on wildlife crime related stories and also examples on how to design investigation and compose stories in the most effective way uh, to deter wildlife crime. We encourage uh, journalists to participate in this course because uh, we believe if you participate in this course, you will increase your understanding and appreciation of the root causes, effects and consequences of wildlife crime at local, national and international levels but you'll also get an opportunity to use tools and knowledge from this learning library that can assist to write effectively about wildlife crime. For more information on this resource, uh, you can contact Belinda Glenn. Her contact details are shown under there. She can provide you more information on how you can register and how you can participate on this exciting learning opportunity. With these few remarks, I think I'll hand it over to Belinda to continue with the program for the day. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Deborah. Uh, let's just get back in there. Okay, so we now come to the panel discussion portion of this webinar. And we are really fortunate to have Julian Rademeyer facilitating this discussion for us. For those who don't know him, Julian is the director for East and Southern Africa at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. He is also a former investigative journalist and an author. His best-selling book, Killing for Profits, Exposing the Illegal Horn, Rhino Horn Trade, 
was shortlisted for the Alan Payton Award, South Africa's most prestigious literary prize for nonfiction. His work on illegal wildlife trade and organized crime has been featured in publications from around the globe. Before I hand over to him, just a reminder, please do feel free to chat in any questions for the panel members or for Julian during this conversation, as we want to keep it as interactive as possible. And over to you, Julian. Thanks very much, Belinda. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful privilege to be able to participate in this event. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that we have some of the, the world's leading experts on pangolin trade and on pangolins uh, present today. As someone who, who works as a journalist who spent a lot of time and, and became involved in illegal wildlife trade work um, through journalism, um, I'm, I'm keenly aware of the role that journalists can play in shining a spotlight on these issues, in digging deep be, be beyond the headlines, um, and in trying to, to foster greater understanding and educating a public, and in trying to, to uh, investigate uh, the various trades that we encounter. Um, I think today you're going to be hearing a, a range of stories. Some of those are stories of tragedy. Some are stories of immense successes. Um, and they're stories from the front lines of efforts to try and combat the illegal trade, um, both, both globally and regionally. Um, I'd like to just kick off very quickly with um, an introduction to some of the, the panel or to the panelists. Um, first up, we have Prof Professor Ray Jansen, who is the founder and chairman of the African Pangolin Working Group. Uh, Ray has been working on Pangolin since 2009 and founded the, the working group in 2011 in an attempt to curb and reverse illegal trade in these endangered mammals. Um, he's written extensively, including uh, four, working on four books, looking at the, at the ecology, genetics, evolutionary history, cultural use and trade in African pangolins. Um, he's also been very involved, and, and we've partially met through that, um, to driving counter-poaching intelligence-driven operations uh, to retrieve pangolins uh, from, from the illegal wildlife trade. He's also testified in various cases. And um, he's worked very closely with, with a variety of law enforcement agencies on these issues. Next up, we have Nick Ehlers, um, who's the Africa Program Director for Traffic. Um, Nick, for his sins, also had to share an office with me for a number of years. Uh, Nick has been working on in the field of development and natural resource management for the past 18 years. Prior to traffic, Nick uh, was the project leader, or, or prior to his current role, was the project leader for the USAID-funded Wildlife Traps Initiative. I, I speak under correction, but I think that's probably the longest running um, illegal wildlife trade or wildlife trade project that, that USAID has supported. Uh, and that work was designed to improve understanding of the status and trends of illegal wildlife trade between Africa and Asia uh, and implement effective strategies together with governmental and non-governmental partners uh, to combat the transcontinental trade. Uh, the Wildlife Traps Project conducted a wide range of research assessments. Uh, one of these is a global report on pangolin trafficking, which uh, was, and I think still is today, the most comprehensive study of its kind. Um, we also joined by D.P. Pillay, who's a crime investigate, a criminal investigative specialist at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, his focus has been on transnational organized crime, and he has also worked extensively on wildlife trafficking cases specifically related to the trafficking of pangolins. Uh, then we have Hong, Hong Shang Hong, who is the founder and CEO of China House. Um, Hong graduated from the journalism school at Fudan University. Uh, he's worked with a range of international organizations uh, and been reporting and researching on, on Chinese overseas uh, business, social and environmental conflicts in Latin America, Africa and other countries. Uh, he started China House in 2014, hoping to uh, integrate China into global sustainable development through a global citizenship education and youth engagement project and program. Uh, he has also uh, got experience doing undercover investigations into the uh, illegal ivory trade. Some of that work was also featured in the film, uh, The Ivory Game. Uh, then we have on the on another side, Dr. Corinne Lawrence, who is the founder, director and head of the uh, head veterinarian at the uh, incredible Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. Um, Corinne has been doing a lot of work. She, she co-founded the, the hospital with Nikki Wright, uh, and the hospital specifically focuses on the Temex pangolin, 
um, has and has developed a speciality in in dealing and treating with with um, pangolins. Um, she is also the the co-author of a, a chapter on the veterinary health of pangolins, and is currently the most experienced veterinarian worldwide treating this particular species of pangolin. Uh, she'll also be joined by Craig Schulter Douglas, uh, who's an ecologist for and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. Uh, and Craig has been involved in, in post rehabilitation of pangolins. Uh, there's some incredible success stories there too, which we'll, we'll speak about later. Um, that includes conducting habitat sustainability assessments, planning potential release sites for pangolins that have been rehabilitated, uh, carrying out a soft release process and continuing long-term monitoring of, of released pangolins. Um, right, so just as a, as a quick snapshot before we get into the discussion, um, in, the, in the past 50 years, uh, the planet's seen a catastrophic decline in ecosystems and natural environments. Um, the WWF study from uh, 20, a few years back, I think it was 2016, uh, has found that the size of wildlife populations has dropped by an average of 60%. And there are long-term impacts of that, uh, impacts that will, that will be felt for generations to come and that will change the way that we live. Um, pangolins within that context are the most trafficked non-human mammal. Uh, the world's eight pangolin species are all experiencing catastrophic levels of poaching and trafficking uh, to feed demand for scales, meat, and other body parts. All of them are listed as, as threatened or endangered. Um, to give you a couple of stats here, to put this in context, more than a million were, are estimated to be slaughtered and trafficked in the 13 years from 2000 to 2013. Um, despite an international ban on commercial trade, which came into effect in 2017, the trade has continued and appears to be growing at an alarming rate. Uh, between 2016 and 2019, about 228 tons of pangolin scales were seized globally according to the Wildlife Justice Commission. Nearly two thirds of seizures took place between uh, 2018 and 2019. Average weights of seizures have also gone up from 2.4 tons in 2016 to around 6.8 tons in 2019. Um, now, a ton, it's something that's, that's almost difficult for most of us to even contemplate what a ton of pangolin scales uh, equates to. Um, but by some estimates, around a ton of scales would indicate that poachers have killed 1,900 animals. So 228 tons, you're looking at you know, over 430,000 uh, animals that have been poached. Nigeria has quickly emerged as a primary hub for pangolin and ivory trafficking. Uh, there are a number of significant seizures that point to this. April 2019, there was a seizure in Singapore of 180 kilograms of ivory and 12 tons of metric tons of pangolin scales. Five days later, another seizure of 12.7 tons. Both of those seizures were of consignments that were bound for Vietnam. Uh, three weeks ago this year, uh, Nigerian authorities themselves seized around 8.8 .8 tons of scales and in 57 sacks, along with consignments of ivory and lion bones. Those were also destined for, for Vietnam, for the port of Haiphong. But China, in many ways, seems to be the primary uh, recipient of many of these, of these shipments. And much of the trade is, is um, headed to China for a range of medicinal uses. And we'll come to that discussion a bit later when we look at some of the interventions that have taken place in China uh, recently. But I think to start off with, um, the Professor Ray Jansen has done uh, an extraordinary amount of work, both in researching this trade and looking at the regional impacts and also on the law enforcement side, um, trying to, to combat the illegal trade. And Ray, I was thinking perhaps you could speak up uh, or, or kick off a bit with just giving us some context of, of what this all means uh, in terms of seizures that have taken place that you're aware of and the role that uh, an organization like yours, the African Pangolin Working Group, can play in working with, with law enforcement agencies. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Julian, and um, welcome, everybody. Um, we've been fortunate enough to work and create a very close relationship with um, a numerous law enforcement agencies in South Africa, uh, such as the South African Police Service, the Directorate of Priority Crimes Investigation Unit, the Environmental Management Inspectorate uh, of the Government, as well as um, provincial nature conservation authorities and bringing them all under 
sort of one platform in a cohesive um, way to try and combat the illegal wildlife trade, uh, specifically in pangolins. Um, and we've been somewhat successful over the last five or six years. Um, nationwide, as of uh, last year, 2020, uh, 38 pangolins were retrieved out of the illegal wildlife trade. And interestingly enough, um, it was one more than 2019, which we saw uh, 37 pangolins uh, retrieved out of the trade in, in, in South Africa. And the, the previous year, 2018, was quite a large spike with 48 individuals. Um, so uh, it's not a unit, so to speak, but, but more of a collaboration, which is incredibly important. And in recent times, um, also with the US Department of Homeland Security, and DP will speak about that um, shortly. And these are mostly intelligence-driven intelligence operations um, from uh, messages and intel mostly from citizens and from the public that end up with us. And um, it's, it's quite an art in a way to sort of reel the suspects in. You have to almost create a sense of trust with them. And you also have to follow the legal uh, ramifications. In other words, you can't sort of have an entrapment procedure, you've actually got to ask permission from the government um, for what we call a, 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 a go ahead uh, for this intelligence operation. And that all goes into the docket and it's very important in court cases that it's all done ethically and legally and with human rights in, in mind as well. But um, effectively, you know, once you start communicating with the traders um, and gaining their trust, then it, it leads to um, setting a time and setting a date. We don't really like to talk too much about money um, and the promise of money. Uh, we, we rather sort of communicate that we'd like to see the animals alive and we, we're interested in its welfare. And uh, obviously they just want to sell it for a, for a quick buck. But um, I think the world also has to take note that a lot of this is driven by greed, but also a lot of it is driven by poverty. Um, the large majority of people people that are arrested are uh, destitute people, often from our bordering countries. The large majority from Zimbabwe, also um, suspects from Mozambique and Botswana and Namibia. But um, I would say 70 to 80% are migrant labor from our neighboring countries. And a lot of these neighboring countries, um, you know, they fall and the economies fall into bits and pieces. Um, a classic example is Zimbabwe where, um, job opportunities are very rare and um, people without jobs form the majority of people earning very small um, income uh, for their households. And they often refer, refer back to crime and get involved in crime and wildlife trafficking is one of those activities. And pangolins are now perceived to have a high value, uh, financially speaking, and they get involved in the smuggling of pangolins and selling of pangolins, um, often just to feed their families or in, in a way just to get get rich. And then they involve middlemen, um, often then South Africans who want a slice of the cake. And I would say 10 to 20% of this, of this trade is now organized crime. And we see this, this value escalating annually. So next, next year, we could see it going from 20 to 30% organized crime, as these pangolins are not sold per kilogram anymore, but um, much like rhino horn per gram. And this becomes attractive for organized crime syndicates. And um, these underworlds to become more and more involved as these animals become rarer. Um, they are banned out of any commercial trade, their CITES Appendix 1. So um, there is no legal trading in pangolins. You are allowed to work with pangolins for scientific research, but any commercial trade is illegal. So it's gone completely underground. And as soon as you drive something underground, it becomes rarer, it, the price goes up. Just like drugs, as they become rarer and rhino horn becomes rarer, the price per gram goes up. And then it becomes much more lucrative for organized crime and for these syndicates. And it becomes more dangerous for um, the, the people involved in these intelligence-driven operations. And this is what we're seeing um, becoming more prominent annually and within every year as we're moving forward. Thanks, Ray. Um, I mean, just just as a follow up quickly, are you so the, the bulk of the um, operations that you're doing here involved in and also the, you know, the kinds of arrests that we're seeing, 
much of that seems in South Africa in particular seems to be opportunistic with an element of that that is, you know, organized crime. So you'd have people coming across the border or people who found a pangolin or picked a pangolin up in the wild looking for buyers and essentially shopping around for buyers. Is that is that the experience that you have? And then just to follow up on that um, from the socioeconomic perspective, um, obviously, you know, we were at a stage now uh, just over a year into the global pandemic. Um, I don't think that we've really yet hit the point where we realize quite how dire the, the socioeconomic impacts have been. I think we've got an idea of what they could be, but I, I suspect that in many communities it's going to be catastrophic. Are you concerned about that feeding into, into more of this, um, these, these types of trades? Yeah, thanks, Julian. To get back to your original question, um, a lot of it is opportunistic uh, poaching events, but um, in, in recent times, we've seen a call put out to local communities to go and search for this particular animal, the pangolin. Um, with the perception that they could make a lot of money for it. So if you, you get these young guys who look after the goats and the cattle out in, in the rural savannah bush areas of Zimbabwe and, and northern parts of South Africa, the large part of Mozambique, and these, these young boys spend up to 12, 13, even 14 hours a day with their goats and cattle um, herding them in, in, the, in the African savannah. And you take a male pangolin or a female for that matter, they, they're territorial, they've got home ranges, they aren't large home ranges, they've got favorite burrows, and these guys know where they are. Culturally speaking, pangolins are, are held in have very high regard through the majority of African tribal communities south of the Sahara, right through Africa, and um, certainly in Southern Africa, not any layman can can pick up a pan, pangolin or handle a pangolin. It's reserved for um, traditional healers, uh, traditional leaders. Um, and so the opportunity to, to make money, if you offer these, um, what we call herd boys, uh, you know, 100 or 200 Jewish dollars, they will go and find you a pangolin and they'll bring it to you within a day because they know where they are because they're just so familiar with the bush. So we're seeing uh, more frequently that the word is put out into these rural communities that they're looking for pangolins. The pangolins are brought in. They're offered what we call a small reward, but to them is a large reward. And um, that's how the pangolins move into the trade. We've also um, retrieved mobile phone footage uh, from individuals where they've trained their, their local family dogs to sniff out pangolins out of their burrows. So there are ways and means to source these animals um, if the demand is, is, is high enough. And with the so socioeconomic um, issues that we faced at the onset of the pandemic, where we've seen in certain communities up to 70, 80% of those um, households losing income from maybe one or two members uh, that work in cities that may have worked at restaurants or within any industry that have been impacted on by this pandemic, We've seen the knock-on effects, certainly with um, localized poaching just to provide meat for the table, but also poaching to bring in a revenue and income to that family. So the knock-on effect of the pandemic um, in, in terms of illegal crime, generally speaking, and wildlife crime in particular, uh, has been highly noticeable. And, um, you know, last year, retrieving 38 pangolins out of the trade within South Africa alone, which is considered marginal compared to other countries in Central and West Africa, it, it, it's disturbing um, that it was higher than the year before, before the pandemic even struck. So it just shows you um, the, the, the increase. Um, and even though people were restricted from moving, it didn't stop the trade in pangolins. When this country, South Africa, moved from um, level three to level four lockdown and people were able to move around with a lot more freedom. We saw a lot more pangolin trade increasing towards the latter part of last year, in particular September, October and November leading up to Christmas and um, uh, to a certain extent the borders reopening um, with Mozambique and Zimbabwe in particular. So I, I don't see um, trends within the pangolin trade um, reducing to any extent in the near future. Although our success has been relatively high, um, the word out there is that we're starting to lock people up and there are jail terms for people caught poaching in pangolins. 
I think the demand is the most important issue, um, in particular from Asia. And when these high prices are put onto a species or a group of species, the Foliodota, which are eight species of pangolin in the world, um, we're going to see much more trade and we're going to see prices being escalated. And the problem here is the four Asian species of pangolin, their populations have dropped significantly to close on extinction levels because they've been traded and sourced out of their natural environments to such a large degree. The trends within Asian rhino, Asian perlimon, Asian tiger, that they're now sourcing uh, African pangolins, African rhino, African lion, and African perlimon um, to meet their cultural demands. So education is a huge thing. Law enforcement is just as important. Um, but, you know, we've got about two decades uh, to save the Foley Dota. And if something isn't done within the very, very small window that we have right now, I, mm. I think all eight species are going to be faced with a certain level of extinction. Thanks, Ray. Sobering words. Um, let's, let's zoom out a bit. Uh, Nick Ehlers, um, Africa Program Director for Traffic. Uh, you've done some work also under the USAID-funded One of Traps project, uh, looking at the global trade in pangolins. Perhaps you could give us a picture of that. I mean, you have shifting routes, you have new methods and, and uh, uh, elements sort of changing constantly as syndicates adapt. We have this new, you know, this recent emergence of, uh, of Nigeria in the last few years as a central hub, not only for, for pangolin trade, but for other items too. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Julian. Um, and hi, everybody. Um, I did put some uh, visuals together to the uh, to show. You can see, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, as as Julian mentioned, we um, as part of the Traps project, we were involved in a, a range of um, ongoing research, and it just kind of shows, as Julian was saying, I mean, the Wildlife Traps project started in, in 2013. It is, as far as I know, the longest standing uh, illegal wildlife trade project funded by USAID, but, and it lives on. I'll give you a, an idea of what's uh, coming next um, in the next few years as well. Um, but we really just, when the project started, um, it just shows you how things can change. I and mean, pangolins were on the radar, um, but in keeping with the point that Ray just made, actually a lot of the trends we see, unfortunately, in, in uh, African species are as a result of the, the major declines of, of sourcing in, in Asia, which has now brought a lot of the trade uh, to the continent. Um, and we really were starting to see this you know, alarming uh, trends of these seizures coming up and, and really thought, it, you know, it was time to do as robust a study as we could to really shed light on, on the, the changing trends over time, but try and tease out some patterns based on, on the seizure information available, um, but also just to, to give more evidence base for agencies and uh, practitioners to target their resources. So that set us off on a multi-year <laughs> <laughs> quest to, um, in partnership with the University of Adelaide in, in uh, Australia, um, with multiple contributions from NGO partners, open source media, a lot of government agencies, a lot of CITES management authority data, the US Fish and Wildlife, and many more to put together the most consolidated seizure database that we could um, in covering a period of two, six years, 2010 to 20, uh, 2015. Um, and uh, I re realizing now that the information is somewhat outdated, we're gonna give you a, a slide on some more updated um, uh, uh, trade analyses that we've done in recent months. Um, but just to give a snapshot, and this first picture actually is just a, a, a summary graphic from, from the report. I included the, the uh, address there. I can probably pop that in the chat box if people want to have easier access or if somebody wants to pull that and put it in. Um, you can go to our, it goes to our website. You can download uh, the full report. It has way more information than you'll ever uh, need, but uh, to cover some of the highlights, um, these, this represents really the, the, the most active trade routes um, that came out of this an, uh, analysis. Um, and uh, I have some additional maps that will go into some more granularity about the types and usage and of, of, the, of the trade. 
Um, but yeah, the, the countries you see here um, and the arrows you know, representing the more magenta or purple uh, color um, are, uh, are incident, or sorry, the incidents that are in orange are ones that have been used um, in five or six consecutive years versus the, the purple ones, which are just ones that have showed up um, more frequently uh, five times or more. So the, the thing that was most alarming about the trade um, was just how vast it was. And of course, trying to, once we got the, the, all the, the, the data that we could, obviously the big caveat is the information is only as good as the, the information we, we received. And of course, this also being representative of law enforcement effort, because these are seizures after all, um, and should be kept in that context. Um, but if you go to the next slide, uh, this is more of a, an overall map of, of incidents. So the report, the database includes 1,270 seizure incidents that we had quali uh, quantitative data um, that we could actually use for comparable purposes. Um, and of this, you can see in comparison to the other map, which pulled out the very key trade routes, this represents all the countries that were implicated in the trade, either as an, or, an origin or source country or transit or a, or a destination. And of course, when I say origin, it's the origin of the trade route, not necessarily the source of the, of the product itself. There's a lot of trans-border trade um, or consolidation that's happening, but this is reflective of the start of the documentation, in other words. So of, the, of these uh, 1,270 incidents, there was actually 159 unique international trade routes associated with uh, Pangolin trade. Um, but interestingly, this, there was a, a, an average of 27 new trade routes that were recorded each year of the study uh, based on the date of the seizure, which shows you just how, how quickly things can change and how new routes are, are, are established. And actually this represents, there were 67 countries in total that were implicated across the whole study of which there was an average of 33 countries a year um, that were involved in the trade in some way along the trade chain. So it involves a lot of countries. The, the darker black you can see are actually just outlines of the source uh, or where the, the range of the eight penguins that Ray was referring to, just to give you an, an overlap of, of the, the, the incidences versus where the countries that were implicated. Um, so this, uh, of the 1,270 1, seizures at the time covering the six, six years, this was a, at the time a staggering 120 tons of pangolins uh, and their products, either that, you know, ranging from scales to body parts to whole pangolins. Um, and, and this was mind blowing at the time. <laughs> and I'm setting up a, a, for dramatic effect the, <laughs> the stats that we're seeing now. But this was really alarming. And China, as mentioned, was a, is a real, it was the most dominant destination. But interestingly, just also because of the information we had available, the US uh, was a very key uh, destination country, but I'll come to that uh, on, on the next slide. But um, of, the, of the African countries that were most implicated in, in, in this study, um, in order of descending, descending order, you have Nigeria, Cameroon, Guinea, Liberia, Equatorial Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Uganda, and Togo, and they all had five or more incidences in this in this report. And similarly, from the Asia side, in descending order, we had China, Vietnam, Indonesia, um, Hong Kong as a territory, um, Malaysia, India, Thailand, Myanmar. Those have twenty incidences or more. Um, so again, you can get a lot of this more detailed information from, from the report itself. But just to go to the next slide, um, this one I pulled just for interest because we, as starting to see patterns and trends as we're talking about, the trade uh, and where it is originating from really determines a lot of the, the, the likelihood of the type of product or commodity that you see in trade. So of that, on that map of, of the little spaghetti noodles, um, the, the red actually represents uh, the trade in scales. Um, and as you can see, the lines going from Africa to Asia are almost entirely scales, which makes sense. 
um, given the the distance and the and the the, the demand for the type of, of sourcing um, it, on its way to Asia, they're much lighter weight, and easier to transport. And incidentally, of, of all the transport types, air freight uh, or air cargo uh, was the most dominant use type for from for trade going between Africa and Asia. And then you see within Asia, there's a lot of yellow. So almost uh, entirely the trade in whole pangolins uh, is, uh, is represented by trade within Asian countries. Um, and this was a trend that, you know, was reflective of the historical use type of pangolins and also just what the end use uh, product is used for in, in consumers, um, but reflected there in yellow and then blue is body parts. So anything that's used for medicinal purposes, claws, skins, uh, et cetera, powder of the, of the scales. Um, and you see a lot of those lines going to, to, to the United States where a lot of the, the seizure information that came from there was a large quantity of seizures, but the volumes of the seizures were very small. So just to, it makes it a little biased to make it look like the US is a major market for pangolin. It's small quantities of a large number of seizures of, of intercepted product and usually in powder form or a traditional historical uh, trade between Mexico for uh, pangolin skins for leather products, belts and boots and so forth um, that you could actually see in the, um, in, uh, the first, first image. So just to get, yeah, that gives a bit of a, an overview. So also interestingly, the, the trade in whole pangolins, um, in the yellow lines, I suppose, are most likely intercepted by overland transport. Um, and as a comparison to scales, which is predominantly air, and then uh, body parts is a, is a mix um, of, of all the different types. So just to move on, I know that the, the, the information is a little outdated in that report, but um, you know, I was saying that the covering a, a, a total of 120 tons over that six year period was pretty staggering at the time. Well, this, uh, we, we contributed to the USA Wildlife Asia um, Counter Wildlife Trafficking Digest, which was published just a few months ago in September. And that looked at a, a, a more updated analysis of seizures involving the countries um, uh, included in that project, which is Southeast Asia and China. But just, you know, uh, linking any seizures involved or, or linked to those target countries, there was in 2019 alone, 82 reported pangolin seizures, um, which represented 155 tons or 155,795 kgs of pangolins. So just the one year alone blew that other six year analysis out the water uh, in these volumes, as Julian alluded to in his intro, of just staggering, staggering volumes of, um, you know, 20, 30 uh, ton seizures, which, you know, you can't even wrap your head around. The logistics involved in consolidating uh, and shipping those, that type of, uh, of, of shipment. So from, the, from this analysis, the key uh, Asian countries that were used as source or origin countries included India, Malaysia, and Nepal. Vietnam, as mentioned, plays a, a huge role in the trade as we see it now. Uh, Vietnam was implicated uh, both as the most commonly uh, used destination for product, as well as uh, the most commonly used country as a transit on its way to China. Um, and similarly, you see some countries that appeared in Africa as on the previous maps. But interestingly, Ethiopia, although it did feature in the analysis, has a much more prominent role in 2019. There were seven incidents, um, specific incidents linked to Ethiopia as an origin uh, uh, for, for a lot of these shipments, which is good to have on people's radar, as well as the emergence of South Africa and DRC amongst other uh, Central and West African countries. Um, so just uh, also interestingly, this uh, of all the seizures in, in 2019, 67% of them were scales only, followed by 24% were live. Um, and, uh, and according to the, the sources of these seizures, uh, the most commonly uh, uh, used species or subspecies of pangolin was the giant pangolin uh, implicated in the 2019s. Of that 155 tons, 46 tons were, were giant pangolin alone. 
have to admit, I'm not exactly sure how they determine that. Uh, morphologically, it may be easier because it is giant to, to compare the scales to others, but just um, as a caveat there. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we've we've uh, in, invested quite a lot of time in, in trying to put together a more robust knowledge base, evidence base. Um, I can leave it there. I can also uh, chat a bit about the, the zoonotic work too, if, if there's time. Yeah, Nick, if you, I mean, if you did want to pick up on that, because I think this is a discussion that there's been a lot of back and forth on this, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, with some reports, some more sensational than others, linking uh, pangolins directly to the pandemic. Um, there's obviously a, you know, a need for some caution there. Uh, it remains, the jury remains out on that issue. There are some, some suggestions of, of a link, but I suspect that it'll probably be be a number of years before we have anything really definitive on that. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you would like to, to expand on that, perhaps also just the, the impact of the pandemic on global trade. Yeah, well, um, just so, so people are aware, the Wildlife Traps project in uh, about the middle of last year received an additional three-year extension. And this was as a result of the, the pandemic to, to kind of pivot and look at more specifically at the zoonotic you know, spillover risk between wildlife and you know, as a response of the kind of mania or hysteria of some uh, of, uh, groups calling for blanket bans on all wildlife trade and you know, so forth. So um, using a lot of the same approaches that we did for the previous eight years of the project, um, wanting to uh, keep that, that evidence base alive to help different stakeholder groups uh, form new partnerships and inject that kind of evidence and ongoing research into how this will inevitably affect regulatory processes and, and trade. Um, so to touch on the first, that point, you know, obviously there's, it's way too early to be making any claims like that. We do know pangolin is amongst the, the some of the key focus species that have the ability to, to host a variety of, of zoonotic uh, diseases. Of, um, and it's just way too early to know exactly what, uh, where that came from, but it does shed a lot of light on, on the risks and the, the more we encroach in, in critical habitats and the interaction, um, you know, overlaps with the way that markets uh, house uh, live animals and so forth, um, you know, obviously the, the, the riskier that is. And, um, and so the project is really going to focus on a couple of key areas. There's a lot of policy work that's going on and ongoing research into changing dynamics and key markets within Central, East, Southeast and East Asia, um, as well as any changes to, to um, the, how products are sold and, and purchased uh, as we see a, a larger shift to virtual markets, for example. Um, and then looking at supply chain. So um, injecting a lot of that knowledge base, looking at traceability over select uh, species and, um, and basically adding additional layers of health and safety with the human and animal uh, health groups into assessment frameworks that help uh, look at sustainability of supply chains going forward. And in the previous uh, eight years of TRAPS, we made you know, a lot of inroads with the transport sector. We've got a massive uh, project around transport as well as with the financial sector and the banks. And both of these spheres are equally concerned and interested in that um, evidence base that's going to help them navigate the future. There's, uh, they're all expecting additional regulations to come as a result of this. They're all expecting additional scrutiny with ensuring the health and safety practices of the products that they transport or finance the transport. And so we're going to continue working with these groups um, as well as other spaces, um, the forensic space as well, uh, with our key partner Trace, who is a Bucanau partner as well. Um, to just keep our finger on the pulse and inject that knowledge base. Um, yeah, and uh, I think, I, did I answer your other question? <laughs> I can't remember what it was. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thanks, Nick. Much okay. All right. All right. Um, just, just to look again at kind of an international perspective, I'd like to bring in um, DP here, um, who is involved with the, the US Department for Homeland Security. Um, I mean, there have been interesting developments as we try to contend with combating the illegal wildlife trade more broadly. 
And we've seen a number of US agencies becoming involved. You know, if you look at the, the Chroma Ivory case, for instance, uh, which uh, in which the, the Drug Enforcement Administration has been involved. We know, for instance, US Fish and Wildlife has been involved in a number of investigations. I think for, for the uninitiated here, what, what sort of role does, does the Department of, of Homeland Security play? Hi, Julian. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, focuses on transnational organized crime. Uh, DHS networks and works closely with law enforcement in various countries. Uh, DHS has a global footprint with approximately 50 officers globally. Uh, DHS has had several successes in the rescuing of pangolins in South Africa, and including a success in Namibia. During the course of last year, uh, DHS played a role in rescuing eight pangolins in South Africa with the 28 arrests and the rescuing of a pangolin in Namibia with the uh, four arrests and five uh, seizures of uh, pangolin skins. Uh, DHS has provided intel on various uh, operations and has worked closely on undercover operations with the local law enforcement in various countries. Um, we have the capabilities of providing digital forensic analysis. Uh, during the course of last year, four suspects were arrested in the Midland area uh, and a pangolin was rescued. Uh, during the course of the trial, uh, uh, three of the queues were uh, charges were going to be withdrawn against them. Uh, DHS was requested to assist with digital forensic analysis on the cell phones of the four suspects. Uh, this was done and the four suspects were linked uh, in the commission of the crime. We have a global footprint uh, and you know, hopefully in the near future we can identify uh, the level three national buyers, the facilitating couriers and the level four exporters and the level five international receivers and buyers. We are planning on working on a project jointly with the uh, Directorate of Priority Crimes Investigation in ident identifying these guys. Currently, we've identified the level one poachers, individuals and groups and level two, the local receivers or couriers that have been apprehended in these successful operations. We work closely with NGOs, especially, specifically the African Pangolin Working Group and also the Johannesburg Wildlife uh, Hospital. Great, thank you. Um, what, I mean, what do you think are some of the key challenges in trying to, to deal with these issues? I mean, if you, you know, every law enforcement conference I've been to in recent years, I think, you know, one of the things that comes up is the lack of information sharing, coordination between different agencies across borders, uh, within countries as well, you know, between different provinces. What, what, what do you think the main sort of challenges in trying to, to get various, both, you know, government and non-government actors to work together uh, in trying to come up with a sort of coordinated strategy, both, both sort of locally and, and um, potentially across borders? Currently, uh, DHS has a, an excellent working relationship uh, within South Africa with the various organizations. And uh, early this year, uh, DHS uh, actually proposed a long-term project to identify these uh, uh, national buyers, exporters, and international receivers and end users. We've also suggested that we are open uh, the international role players and our offices that are lo located abroad to assist with this long-term project. We've identified uh, some of our exporters and national buyers and hopefully uh, with this collaboration with this excellent uh, relationship that we built uh, during the course of this past, uh, of the several years, uh, we will combat and apprehend these suspects. Excellent, thanks, thanks very much. Um, I'd now like to turn to Hong Xiang Huang, who's uh, in Beijing, I think it's probably quite late there, around 9 p.m. Um, I, just to you know, come in on the on the aspect of of China. I know that you've you've been involved in looking at aspects around the the ivory trade, but particularly around the uh, the pangolin trade. Um, we know that there've been efforts, obviously, in the wake of the pandemic, to to strengthen some of the regulations around trade in live pangolins. 
Uh, that doesn't seem to necessarily translate into, into trade in pangolin scales or use of pangolin scales in, in traditional medicines. Um, but there are indications as well with some of the seizures that you also have proactive work being done by Chinese law enforcement. Um, we know that Chinese enforcement agencies have also um, had contact with some of their African counterparts. Is that translating in any way into a real impact or is there, is there still a lot of work left to be done? Uh, sure. Thank you, Julian. So hi, everyone. Now it's time to pick on China. So um, to begin with... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. So to begin with, like, um, so uh, we all know, like, definitely China is one of the largest market for global pangolin trade. And pangolin scale is used in China for Chinese traditional medicine, which is seen as helpful for breastfeeding, feeding and some other situation, where at the same time, pangolin meat is also seen as a luxury meat in China that was helpful for many, for many, many, like, body situation. And but there are some others. But there, there are, there's also another fact we all need to remember as well. Although we say China is a very large market for pangolin, for for pangolin, but actually inside China, those one who are consuming pangolin, I would say is that is less than 0.1 percent of population. I think that need to be remembered as well. So uh, over the past year, situation as Julian pointed out, like there has been stronger and stronger law. Uh, enforcement in China regarding pangolin trade and so on. And in 2020, we actually have seen a lot of like big change. Uh, in 2020, like uh, pangolin has been upgraded from like second class animal, like protected animal to first class protected animal, which means the use of any kind of like pangolin part in medicine and so on will be more strictly like um, restricted. And also the punishment will be much more serious compared to before. Also, like pangolin scale has been officially removed uh, from the Chinese, what, what, how to say it, like Chinese pharmacy book, like Chinese pharma, pharmacopoeia or something like that. Pharmacopoeia, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, sorry, that word is too long for me. Anyway, so, but at the same time, we also, we also noticed that like pangolin scale is still seen in eight of the prescription inside that. China med medical book. And in general, I would say the situation right now is that in China over the past few years, the law enforcement has been stronger and stronger. And also uh, awareness regarding like pangolin protection has been higher and higher thanks to a lot of like government and, and NGOs work. We see a lot of ads in Subway, in airport. We see a lot of movie stars like uh, promoting pangolin protection and so on. So I would say the situation in general is getting better. However, what I would say remain as the largest challenge is that, um, as we all know, like conservation in general, like wildlife conservation in general, it's still very far away for many, many normal Chinese people. We, we, we see a lot of like NGOs being very active. They're doing a lot of like activity. They're doing a lot of promotion. But unfortunately, right now, the situation is like usually usually the one who actually read the social media of those NGO who actually participate in the activity of those NGOs are not the ones who are really consuming illegal wildlife like pangolin and so on and so on. Although we've seen a lot of like, we, we already see a lot of like promotion going on, but at the same time, when we travel to different places in China, actually even recently because it was the Chinese New Year. So I came back to my hometown, which is in Guangdong, and I was spend, spending time with my families. And we all know there have been already a lot of promotion regarding like, uh, regarding like shark fin and so on. However, still in Chinese restaurant here, you see a lot of like people consuming shark fin without any idea that shark fin trade has any kind of problem. So I would say how to reach out to the, Chin to the majority of Chinese population to to make them be aware and care about the issue is still a very big challenge. And also there's another thing I think is worth it to be pointed out is that when we are talking about China, the role of China, we're not only talking about Chinese in China, but we should be also talking about Chinese in other countries in the world right now. Because over the past few years, I actually have done quite a lot of research and work in Africa, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia and so on regarding the role of like China in local conservation, wildlife trade and so on. And what I would see is that today there's a huge population of Chinese community that are, that's in Africa and in other places as well. And they are actually very important 
compared to, I would say actually a lot of the time more important compared to Chinese in China. Because as I said before, like in, in inside China, to be honest, myself, I haven't seen anyone selling pangolin so far, like meat or skin or anything. However, when we're talking about Chinese who are living in Africa and so on, a lot of them they have seen and a lot of them they have actually consumed those kind of products before. And although we see a lot of like, for example, conservation NGOs uh, spending a lot of effort trying to organize activity and so on. But what I have known is that Chinese communities in Africa and so on is a group that many NGOs fail to actually really reach. And a few years ago, um, thanks to the support of Humane Society International, we organized with some other partners in South Africa called Africa China Wildlife Conservation Conference at Wits University. And during that event, we successfully convinced some Chinese companies in South Africa and some rich Chinese businessmen in South Africa to donate some money for pangolin conservation. And what I can share with you is some of the reaction like these Chinese people share with me. So uh, one CEO of one of the Chinese, one of the biggest Chinese companies in South Africa, he was very surprised when I told him that we want to do something to protect pangolin. It was the, actually the first time he heard people are protecting pangolin. And his reaction was like, why? Why protect pangolin? They look ugly. They are like big rat. Why should we protect pangolin? So although on our side, we feel like, oh, everyone knows we should protect pangolin, but not for him. And it doesn't mean they cannot be changed. One of the very rich Chinese businessmen who are living in South Africa, he donated some money for pangolin conservation at that time. And I remember at the end of the activity, like privately, he was telling me this, you know, Hong, I am very good at cooking pangolin and they are delicious. But now after this activity, I cannot eat them anymore, you know? So I, and I was very touched by that moment. And I feel that if we actually pay more attention to try to engage the Chinese people, especially the large, the majority of Chinese people who are not conservationists, but at the same time, they are not like terrible people. If we can spend more energy to engage them, and if we find the right way to engage them, then many, many more impacts can be done. So, mm. yeah. Thanks, Hong. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think you know, it's very easy to make sort of generalizations about China, and we need to be careful about that. Also, in fairness, I think, um, you know, the other point that we should raise is that there's significant um, consumption of pangolins in Africa. Uh, both work that, that Nick Ehlers and I have done in the past has looked at, at uh, consumption in Central Africa and how some of that feeds into the international trade too. Um, you know, story from Cameroon where um, previously, people would buy pangolins when they could afford it as a, as a luxury good. The meat would be consumed and the scales would be thrown away. Now, if you go to dump sites around Douala, you don't see pangolin scales anymore because people are consuming it and then selling on the, on the scales to very often to local Chinese middlemen and so on. So I think, I think that's an important point. Do you think the, um, you know, in general discussion, I mean, you've obviously, you based a lot of the time in Nairobi, but you've been back in, in Beijing for a while now. Do you think that the the um, pandemic has focused attention more on on sort of wildlife trade more broadly in China? I mean, is there a lot more discussion? This is obviously completely anecdotal, but you know, is that something that you're experiencing? Uh, well, so uh, for our organization's work, China House, because essentially what we do is there's one important part of our work is what we call like global citizenship education in China, like to help Chinese youth understand global sustainable development more. And because of that, we have been interacting with a lot of like Chinese people, especially Chinese young people. And I have been going to a lot of schools in China, like universities, high schools to give a speech and so on. And over the past few years, uh, over the past one year, what I can, what I have seen like in my eyes is that because at the very beginning, uh, many people uh, see the pandemic as like seriously related to wildlife consumption and so on. And that pandemic has created a lot of trouble for many, many, for, well, for all the people. And because of that, and as I said before, not all Chinese in China are consuming pangolin and ivory and so on. So, and because people, those, because many Chinese people see, oh, like, you the ones who are consuming this wildlife product you are the ones who are creating trouble so actually people become much more concerned about like wildlife conservation and then become much more angry regarding like wildlife trade and so on and i can see 
much more people are becoming aware of the situation and they care much more about it. Because to be honest, if it's only like about protecting animals, not all the people they would, at least in China, not all the people they would care. But when it comes to, it actually create a lot of damage to many like people who like people like ourselves, our families and so on, much more people seem to care. And that has brought a lot of positive change. And that's what I can say in China. Thanks very much. Um, right, moving on to one of our other panelists. Um, I, um, sorry, I'm just finding my notes here because uh, I keep getting the order muddled, my apologies. Um, I'd like to move on to Dr. Corinne Lawrence from the uh, Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. And I think here we can probably get onto a couple of success stories. We've heard sort of bleak apocalyptic stuff um, but there have been some really encouraging tales coming out of, of South Africa uh, in recent whiles in terms of both rehabilitation of pangolins, but also the release of pangolins and then the little December surprise, which Craig Schulter Douglas can talk about. But um, Corinne, you were involved in the, uh, well, the rescue and then the rehabilitation of a pangolin called Corona from the very early phase of, of the pandemic. I wonder if you could, could tell us a little bit about how that came about in that particular case, but also I think what, I don't think too many people realize how difficult it is to actually rehabilitate pangolins and how, how little success there has been. So, you know, every bit of success that we do have is, is actually, is, is quite something and something to be celebrated. Hi. Hi, Julian. Yes. Hi, everyone. Maybe I should start so before I get to Corona. Um, Corey for short sometimes for us and Craig will know her as well. Um, maybe I should start where and how we get the pangolins at the hospital uh, and, and, and the journey from there and then we get to the success story of that is okay. Um, we normally get them uh, post confiscation out of a sting operation like, like Ray said. Um, normally the joint operation with the African Pangolin Working Group as well as law enforcement branches whether it's the South African Police Service, the Hawks, um, local EMIs um, in, a, in a province. Um, once they are confiscated from these poachers, we get them at the hospital. Um, and the condition we get them in is, 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 most, is most often um, quite horrendous. They've been normally kept in bags or drums or why we had one or two bolted into the wheel well of a car. Uh, it was covered in diesel. And they're often kept in this condition or these conditions for up to We've had one in there for two weeks. We've had one that was specifically, uh, they had a wire cage made for it. So when it rolled up, they closed it into that wire cage and it could not move for, uh, we think, about 10 days. So it's lying in its own urine and feces for that time. Um, they come in, obviously, they've not been fed or in most instances are not even given water for this period of time. They're dehydrated, they're emaciated, starving animals, and, and so many disease processes going on. So for us, the biggest challenge was in, for Banglin, for me, was when I got my first Banglin is what, how and what and where, how, sorry, my cat is being very, very inquisitive. Um, how and what and where, how do you treat it? What is normal, you know? Uh, where do you put a drip? How much of what medication can you give? Is it safe? Um, and, and, and what animals do you treat it as? Like a feline, a cat, a bovine? What is it? Um, so for us, we, we battled in the beginning because some of the people we asked in the African countries that had some experience with this particular species uh, had very vague answers or, or sometimes was really unwilling to help. Um, so I contacted a, a couple of vets that had experience with the Asian species. Um, they are different to ours, but at least I could get some sort of idea veterinary wise what they were doing. Um, and we started sort of working from that point of view. Um, and then we had to ID, ID the disease processes in them. And then I always tell people, you know, when you take your dog or cat to the vet, you take blood and or the vet takes blood and puts it in a machine and it tells you what's normal and what isn't. You know, that you have a set of normal values that you can that you can um, compare to the ones for your sick animal. Uh, unfortunately, that did not exist for Temex Bangalore. And I did my master's recently in them where I actually um, looked at the, the 
reference values for chemistry and hematology in this particular species to help us in the hospital. And I, ha I completed my master's and now we do have a set of normal values. So every pangolin we get in, if we do blood tests, Kevin, sorry, cat, um, we do blood tests, we can actually run it in the hospital and we know what to treat and how to treat it. And one of the biggest challenges, and Craig will tell you as well, we face today is because of what we have found and, and, and the progress we have made. And with progress, I mean our success rate has gone from 50% in 2017 to 80% being released back into the, into the wild from being admitted after a confiscation, which is a huge increase. And it's all, all because of what we've learned in this in the, in the last four years. And one of the biggest challenges we're facing at the moment is convincing other rehab centers in Africa not to release Bangladesh too soon after they have been admitted. Um, Linda, if you can give me, the, put that one picture up there, one or two. If you look at this picture, the photo on the left is of a healthy pangolin in Tuolu in the Kalahari, one of the pangolins I drew, uh, wild free living pangolins I drew blood from. She's healthy. You can see she's quite fat. She's, that's a normal pangolin. Pangolin on the right is one that we recently got in, in a pangolin named Callan. And if you look at his photo, you can see the scales on the abdomen sort of roll in. You can see structures in the abdomen. Whereas on the left hand side, that female, you can see nothing but just a nice flat, fat layer. Um, and unfortunately, when you have these animals standing up and walking around in the practice um, or wherever, they look normal. They hide their injuries really, really well. They hide their, uh, their health issues wrong really well. So unless you actually sedate them, because uh, you cannot um, unroll a healthy or conscious pangolin rather, not a healthy one, a conscious one, they curl up into a ball. Not even an adult lion can open it. So how on earth are we supposed to do it? So once you've opened it, you can see, you know, it's thin. And then you, and you, you run your bloods and um, we found really, really um worrying things about their lungs that we didn't know before um and with the event of ct scans we started using ct scans in them we've also um, diagnosed a lot more and since then we haven't actually lost a single one in the last single six months because of our i mean i call it upping our game a bit but you know all the things we found out so for me the success stories if one if belinda the next photo please is a pangolin called tom and if you look here, he was um, confiscated from poachers who had him, uh, and and they brought it, and we we got him with the with this with the snare on. You can see the snare um, sort of on around his chest area and abdomen. We're not sure whether they placed the snare and so cat caught him, but we actually think that he um, went through a snare and actually broke it off of the branch or whatever it was on and walked off like that because we the injury showed that that snare was probably on for at least 10 days to two weeks and it was so deep it was actually all the way into the bone onto the ribs there um, and he was in hospital with us for 110 days to to heal and that picture on the right is the wounds after six weeks of treatment and uh, he has also gone to, to Craig and them, he'll tell you, dear Tom. And he's doing well. Uh, after months and months of being released now, he's gaining weight. He's doing fantastically well. But um, it's just one of the things we do. And it costs our hospital quite a lot. And we try to tell this to the court as well. I also testify in court, especially in aggravation of sentencing, because um, the what vets do and what I do is we try and give a voice to the animal so that the magistrate or the judge can understand what suffering this animal has gone through. So, um, you know, they look at an animal and this animal, particular pangolins, they don't make any noise. They, um, they're very stoic. So able for, they don't cry like a dog or, or, or vocalize like other animals. So I had to explain or have to explain to the court what suffering in this particular animal means. And, and when the magistrate and judge see that, they're actually quite um, moved by it. And and then we add a cost value also. It costs our hospital almost 1,500 Rand a day per pangolin. And at one stage, we had 10 at the same time in the hospital. And this also, because of many defense lawyers ask for a, f uh, a fine. So then the magistrate or the judge will see, oh my goodness, it doesn't just cost 5,000 Rand or 10,000 Rand. So a fine is almost, it's 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 really not enough of a a, a a sentence or a conviction in our case. So another success story, and I, I'll leave one for Craig. 
Uh, one is Ali. Uh, she was uh, a pangolin we um, retrieved and she was pregnant when she came in. And there's always a bit of a, a happy and a sad story when we have pregnant animals coming in because it's like anything that stresses too much. You're so worried about the mother. She is the more important one of the two, but she's been starved. She couldn't look, she couldn't uh, feed the fetus. Um, it wasn't growing properly. And we're always worried about um, them aborting in the hospital. And thank goodness, uh, Ali wasn't one of those. And she was released uh, in a, one of the northern more provinces, more north. And thankfully, uh, two or three months after she was released, she had a healthy pangolin pup. And it was one of the first in, well, it was the first one in South Africa that um, was born post rehabilitation uh, to a pangolin that was rehabilitated and then released. So for us, it was a massive success story. And that pup and mom is still doing well. The, bub, uh, the, the pup is a giant fat Buddha riding, riding on its mother. But every time we see photos of it, it's, uh, it just brings tears to our, our, our eyes at the hospital. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, Craig, um, so you've also been very actively involved and I, you know, Ray, if you also want to come in here, I mean, the working with the um, African pangolin working group uh, on, you know, trying to reintroduce pangolins into the wild um, and particularly Tenex uh, pangolin in, in the Pinda area, something, you know, we, where it's been 40 years, if I remember correctly, uh, since they, they last occurred there. Um, and then plus, obviously, you also had some very special news in December. Yes, thanks, Julian, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so we kind of, just an extenuation of, of the African Paglin Working Group and then awesome work that's done at the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. And um, so when we receive these, these pangolins, which we're very grateful for, as, as you correctly said, they, they've been locally extinct in this area for, for over 40 years now. Um, we, we've got the responsibility of, of continuing with that, that medical care and, and, the, and the monitoring of, of each of these individuals. A lot of efforts obviously gone in at this stage and in the sting operations and all the intelligence and surveillance work um, and then the rehab work uh, at the hospital. So when, when we get these animals, um, it, it's kind of the, the bucks passed to us and we, we've got to start start the monitoring process and um it takes various varying amounts of times for different individuals some of them we we have to do a soft release process for for months and months especially younger individuals where, whereas older ones they they seem to sometimes uh within three four weeks we kind of have them in a in a, in a more wild uh, less hands-on approach and um just to give you a, a brief uh outline of, of kind of how how it works is the pangolins come come to one of the release sites like Pinda, um, and uh, we start the soft release process. And initially, for up to three weeks, this involves keeping the pangolin in, in one of our houses um, or, or in a or in the central position, and then we'll take them out every every afternoon um, and and try them feeding in different areas. Through this process, we've kind of developed uh, ant and termite uh, ID kits and, and maps and distribution maps across the reserve. And this really helps us because sometimes these, these pangolin, although they're all the same species, they have very specific dietary requirements. And so we find that some pangolins feed really well on certain species of ants and termites, whereas others uh, prefer other ones. And so we've kind of mapped it out and we have a whole lot of different release sites that, that we can trial. And, and we go every afternoon and we'll take a weight of, the, of each pangolin before the feeding session and then, and then again afterwards. Um, and we kind of also let them explore a little bit, find some potential burrows and, and, and get used to this new environment. None of us really know because we do not have the genetic reference library that we do for things like rhino, where these animals have come from exactly. Sometimes there's a bit of an idea, but we don't always know exactly where they're from. So, so we can't really guess what, what, what uh, habitat they prefer. So it's a trial and error sort of thing. And um, eventually, once we start seeing them picking up their weight and, and start becoming more comfortable in this new, what was foreign environment, we start, we, we, then, we then release them, but under very, very careful monitoring. Um, if, if we can have a look at the next slide, please. And, and during this phase, um, we, we try and be a little bit uh, more hands off, um, but we, 
because we're dealing with such precious, precious cargo here, we have to make sure that we, we still keep an eye on what's going on and we can still monitor daily for the, the first few weeks. And then if we still see a good weight increase and, and, and signs of them settling, like setting up territories or finding and establishing burrow networks, um, we will then only, into, uh, only actually physically weigh them um, on a weekly basis after a few months. And then eventually, like some of them now that have been, been out there for almost two years, um, we, we only see them every two to three months because they're very settled and, and we can monitor them remotely. And so, so once that initial soft release process is finished, we, we attach these, these tags that you can see in the photos here. The one is a, a satellite tag, and that allows us to remotely um, know roughly where these animals are, are moving. And then the smaller one is a, a radio frequency tag or a telemetry tag. And that allows us to actually locate these animals so that we can check that the monitoring devices are still working. Um, we can weigh them to make sure that they're still settling in and, and, and picking up weight. And also so that we can inspect them. Uh, Karin and the team have, have told us very uh, what to look for in a healthy versus an unhealthy pangolin. And, uh, and we've kind of had to learn as we go along. And the, these are the sort of basic tools in the toolkit to, to, to do the soft release process and, and give these animals that were all poached a, a second chance at a, a wild life. That's great, thanks. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, the, 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 the project itself, there's, there's work continuing to try and expand this and grow it, um, looking for, for different areas. Um, I guess that's the one issue. And then I suppose on the, on the lighter side, you certainly get your steps in if you're using a sort of Apple Watch or something to track your steps, because they do need a lot of walking to sort of snuffle around and check out their territory. Um, I mean, maybe just a little bit more about that sort of process, because I've, I've seen, I mean, I, I, I was lucky enough um, a couple of years ago in Zambia to see some, some pangolins being rehabilitated there. And it's, it's very much a sort of hands-on keeping them company letting them explore the terrain that they're being reintroduced to into um, and a lot of walking. Yeah, for sure. As I said in the beginning, each, each one is different. We, we've had two very young pangolins that came to us at under five kilograms. Um, we, we've kind of worked out that until they get to around six and a half kilograms and their scales get hard enough for them to protect themselves against natural predators like spotted hyenas or lions or leopards. Uh, we need to physically walk with them every day, almost as, <laughs> as armed guards, and while they pick up their weight and they establish their little uh, home ranges. Um, and so, so that's, that's months on end. Um, we've had two where, where the, one, the one individual, a young male, we had to walk with him for four and a half months before he was ready to be released. Um, and, and, and the same for a little female, um, that a very, very similar situation where we had to have permanent staff walking every day with, with these animals. Um, and then some of the older ones, if we can go to the next slide, please, Belinda. They still require a lot of walking and monitoring. And, um, and, and just obviously it's, it's not a kind of a walk in the park, so to say. It's a, a lot of these animals are being reintroduced or rewilded into, into big five game reserves. And being predominantly nocturnal, we, we have to do a lot of work at night and walking walking around uh, with dangerous game around. But um, so, so that does have its own logistical constraints and challenges, but um, it's all worthwhile when, when it comes to stories like this. And, and this was the first uh, male that we, we got on the reserve. Um, he, he arrived at the end of May, 2019. Um, and uh, he is such a nice relaxed pangolin after everything and all the trauma he had been through. He just had the nicest personality. And um, this was kind of reiterating what Karen said in terms of when, when we first got these things, none of us had seen one or knew anything about them. And we had, we had very little idea of what to do with them. And um, this is kind of why the, the post-release monitoring is so important. He, he, we released him in the beginning of June. Um, and uh, you'll see, if you look at that graph, he, he started picking up weights within the first month. He, he picked up over a kilogram and things were looking really, really good. Um, but because these animals have been exposed to so much um, uh, in, in the trade and, and there's so much is expected there of them during this rehab process, they often develop underlying conditions that, as Karen said, we, we can't see. But luckily, because of our daily monitoring, you know, we, we, we picked up this huge weight drop, uh, drop after a month. Um, and uh, 
you can see we we, we actually heard he, he, he sounded like he was struggling a little bit and and that with the weight drop uh, kind of showed us that there was something wrong and and this was our, our, our resident wildlife vet who, who had never seen a pangolin, let alone <laughs> touched one before, uh, with a, a screen just above that image speaking to Karen, guiding us through the process of, of, of uh, putting him to sleep and doing the blood tests. And, and we built a little homemade nebulizer. Um, and it turned out he, he had pneumonia. And, and we kind of went through the soft release process again for, for the months of August, September, October, and, and eventually he went out again. And, and now we almost, yeah, almost two years after that. And, and he's gone from the lowest uh, eight kilo, just under nine kilograms. And he's now well over 15 kilograms. And he's still, he's still in, in Pinda. He's still very much close to where we, we initially released him. And we think he's a father to a, a youngster, but we haven't confirmed that yet. But he's kind of the, 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 the case study that everyone who is involved in, in sort of, uh, reintroducing pangolins into into the wild um, can follow, um, and uh, yeah, it's it's he, he's been quite an inspiration to all of us. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. Um, no, thanks, thanks very much. Um, uh, sorry, Corinne, did you want to come in there with a quick point? Are you on mute? I just want to add um, with regards to the tags that are placed on them. Uh, we recently had a workshop in the Northern Cape about uh, talking about pangolins and stuff. And one particular person asked about why we put on two tags. And as Craig can tell you, um, finding um, pangolins is already difficult. And now you put on something with a sight line, a VHF tag of three kilometers. They can walk up to eight kilometers a night and they're out of range and you can't find them. So the satellite helps in that way. Also for my work, it's so important what the post-release monitoring is because it shows or gives me an idea whether our treatment at the hospital is actually working. Because um, a lot of um, people just release animals without having tags on them. So they think they're successful, but unless for me, one can follow the animal post-release, you cannot ever say whether you are truly successful. And one person actually asked us if, you know, they were concerned about the welfare of the animal having two of these uh, tracking devices on them getting stuck in things. But as, and again, Craig and, and Ray from the African Pangan Working Group can tell you, we have monitored almost, I think, nearly 20 animals now with both, um, with both tags on and never have we had an issue with one of the tags being caught. But again, Louis, as he, this is the, this, Banglins named Louis that he has mentioned here. If we didn't have that on Louis, and if they didn't find him every day or when and weighed him, we would never have known he, that he had pneumonia, and we would never have been able to treat it. And he might well have died if this monitoring wasn't done as it was. Right. Thank you um, for that. Um, right. Um, I think at this juncture, what I'd like to do is is open up for for questions um, and also just reflect on a couple of the comments that are going on. There's some really interesting uh, discussions taking place in the chat room, um, and we can we can come back to to any other points. So I'd like to keep this as quite a, a loose discussion. Um, later on, we will also be opening up the floor to questions. So you can either submit your questions in the in the chat box or raise your hand and we'll come to those. Um, I think Ray was making a point um, earlier in, in a discussion um, and there's also a point by Alexis Krill uh, from, the, from the African Pangolin Working Group that um, you know, pangolin consumption in China is a, minor, is a relatively minor issue, Ray, and that the, the use of pangolin scales is, is, on the other hand, is, is massive. I don't know if you wanted to speak a bit about that and maybe Hong, if you, if you wanted to have any comments too. Yeah, well, thanks, Julian. Um, I think to start off with, if you if you look at a um, community's cultural perspectives, um, religion is a cultural view, and if if you tell Christian people that there's no God or whatever, you'll have a small war on your hands, you know. So, a, a cultural um, perceptions and cultural values are, are hugely important to any society across the world, no matter um, what continent you live in. Um, so. I do believe that a lot of the Chinese people don't uh, think they're consuming pangolin parts or pangolin meat or whatever. They, they probably aren't to a certain extent. The, the, the large and huge amount of consumption 
is in cultural medicine, whether it's uh, medicine for spiritual beliefs or medicine to cure ailments, pangolin scales are only a small ingredient in that particular medicine. Um, they don't make up the whole medicine. They make up sometimes a few grams or 10% or even less. Um, there's 60 different commercial medicines that hold pangolin scales in them within China, and they're manufactured on an industrial scale. When I say industrial scale, you can process a ton of pangolin scales in the morning in a, um, a pharmacopoeia a laboratory in China. Um, then it goes out to commercial pharmacies that contain large proportion of these pharmacies are actually cultural medicine and not Western medicine. And just like we don't know what's in our medicines, our microdols or whatever, there, there are lots of diff different chemistry components to it. So do the public in China not know that the ingredient in a lot of those may be pangolin scales. So they're unaware that they are indirectly consuming pangolin scales and um, in a sense, un unbeknowing to them, um, supporting the market. So if there wasn't this market and there wasn't this cons uh, consumption, there, wasn't, there wouldn't be any demand. And if there's no demand, there wouldn't be any trade. I recorded um, in 2019, 97 tons of pangolin scales leaving the African continent. If that's only 10 to 20% of what's actually leaving the continent that we intercept, can you imagine the unsustainable levels of pangolin harvesting in the African continent. So, um, you know, we can't really hide behind um, sort of not knowing. Uh, the, these pharmacopoeia companies know what they're doing. They know they've got a demand for it and they know they're putting a price out there for it. And I think that needs to be addressed really urgently. Thanks, Ray. Um, Hong, I don't know, do you want to come in there with any points? Well, maybe just a little bit, because I have personally, I have met a lot of like Chinese people who actually consume rhino horn and pangolin scale and so on. And what I want to say is that for them, this is not just like a cultural belief. They actually believe it's useful. And, mm. uh, and although we know a lot of people will say, yeah, rhino horn are just like fingernails and so on. But for those ones who are actually consuming, no, they have heard about this and they actually believe it's working. And I would say if we really want to influence them or change them, we also need to be able to try to find a way to understand them as well. Because uh, it could be working. We actually do not, do not know for in, in, in some way. That's mm. why I would add. Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's interesting to point out as well that they're, um, according to the Environmental Investigation Agency, there are around 221 pharmaceutical companies um, that they have identified in around 713 hospitals uh, in parts of China that still produce and sell medicines containing pangolin scales. Um, there's also indications, obviously, of the first use, I think, going back to the, the sixth century. But there's also in Africa, for instance, there's wide use and consumption of pangolin scales for medicinal purposes too, and in other rain states. So, uh, you know, I, I think these are all interesting areas of, of discussion. Um, Alexa, or, um, so Simon Montali also raised a question, Ray, which you kind of answered is, you know, considering this alarming level of pangolin poaching for scales and meat, uh, meat, is there any way of, of determining population status of the, of the four species occurring in Africa? Um, I mean, I've, I've been astonished just looking in, you know, up until my trip to Zambia to see pangolins in a rehabilitation facility. The only other place I'd ever seen a pangolin was um, half dead in a market in Douala in Cameroon. And it's astonishing that pangolins are being pulled out of those forests because you don't see them. I mean, I've, I've never seen a pangolin in the wild. I'm, I'm pretty sure many people on this call have never seen a pangolin in the wild. Um, but trying to assess population sizes, yeah, Julian, it's like trying to count a ghost. You, you know, these things are incredible. They, um, three of the four African species are nocturnal. It's only the black-bellied tree pangolin that, that's diurnal. They um, solitary, they don't make a noise. Um, they sleep and hide away in burrows or hollows in, in the tree. And I've, I've had so many pangolins in my hand, but they're all out of the trade. I've never seen a wild pangolin. <laughs> huh. I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we, we've set camera traps, uh, we've spoken to communities, we've done traditional ecological knowledge of um, when last did you see a pangolin in, in that little village in, in northern Venda in South Africa to try and get a perception on their abundance. But it's just impossible to count these things. Um, 
the uh, IUCN Species Survival Commission. Well, Ray, I think we're losing you. Penguin Specialist Group held a workshop not too long ago. Um, trying to develop a mission abundances and we still we've, we've got ideas and 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 we can infer um abundance from territory sizes for example but territory sizes vary between regions good regions have large territories with with um uh, at least good regions have small territories with abundant resources uh, and and in 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 poor quality habitats you've got these huge territories because resources are lacking um mm. so there that is also difficult um desert pangolins have a larger home range than more mesic uh, savanna pangolins in the east of South Africa and areas where, where Craig um, uh, is monitoring the population that's been released on Pinda. So to count a ghost is, is incredibly difficult. But what we do know, just from the trade data, we can get an estimate of relative abundance that are being poached. And that gives us a, a kind of an indication of how many there are. We've also done interviews in the Gulf of Guinea, in particular, I've done work in Ghana and Sierra Leone and in Southern Africa on communities that live in the savanna regions and in the tropical forests of when they last saw a pangolin, how frequently they've seen a pangolin. And within the last decade, numbers have crashed dramatically. Some people who saw them daily or once a week are now only seeing them once every two, three years. Some haven't seen them for years. So we can um, envisage that the pangolin, general pangolin populations around the world are crashing rapidly. Mm. Um, another, I mean, another very good question that's come up here is, you know, we've got this massive ongoing trade, and I'd, I'd like to throw this out to pretty much anyone on the panel who'd like to deal with it. Um, massive ongoing trade, tons of scales, indications that, um, you know, the at least the the, um, the numbers of scales in trade are growing. Um, but why are we not finding the sort of kingpins, middlemen, I actually hate the word kingpin, but the, the facilitators, the people who play, you know, key roles in, in syndicates and networks, the middlemen, the middle management type people, and, and, and actually having success in, in, un, in unpicking these syndicates and disrupting them. Um, and syndicates that are operating outside of Asia, uh, you know, let's, let's move away briefly from from China, but looking at the syndicates that are operating within Africa, across borders in Africa, regionally, what is the problem there? I, maybe from the law enforcement side, Nick, if you have any thoughts, Ray, Tom. Sure, Ray. I can Anyone? take a step. Yeah, classic question. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it is obviously uh, complex. And I think a big part of it is, uh, I mean, besides the political will, issue, which is always a, a big one for wildlife, you know, it just takes the back burner for a lot of more pressing issues that are on the agenda. Um, we have this um, dynamic where countries are very uh, forthcoming to wave the flag when they've made a seizure. Um, and that actually is detrimental oftentimes to investigations because that's where it usually ends and time and time again I've been leading on a lot of our financial crime work with uh, many of the specialist units and as well as yourself Julian following the money <laughs> and looking at typologies and, and so forth that will d take it to the next level in terms of uh, an investigation uh, that goes follows the the trail to to the higher higher levels of the, of the supply chain or the networks involved um, but it, it gets it gets complicated you know it's that classic case of um, anything involving collaboration with law enforcement in other countries is very is easier said than done even despite all the efforts to create you know networks of capacity as well as um, you know platforms for communication and so forth that it, it um, you know, cross-border investigation is 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 difficult, and um, yeah, and especially the nature of these uh, types of trades. You can see even just from the the spaghetti maps that I presented is the the dynamics change so quickly, and the ability to adapt and 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 pivot. You know, is often just much more flexible than the sovereignty that. Um, that uh, makes law enforcement difficult. Um, and 
Yeah, and then and then of course just the fact that the uh, the trade itself, you know, pangolins are as we were touching on earlier. It's not like there's a specific use type. Um, and pangolins have, from a demand perspective, a variety of uses. And you know, beyond just the, the medicinal that's been mentioned, there's the uh, fashion side of things. There's also the meat for consumption and so forth. So. Um, it just adds layers of complexity to follow the the trail of of how things are actually um, consolidated, shipped, and then uh, arrive uh, for onward use. Um, I just I'll put it in the chat box just while I have my while I'm unmuted uh, to respond to some of the previous questions too. Um, there's a community of practice that we've uh, we, we facilitate under under traffic, but it's a consortium of range of demand behavior change psychologists and experts that um, are uh, work under a, a community of practice called changewildlifeconsumers.org and there's been a real effort to create a, an evidence base for for consumer side research as well as the types of messages and messengers that are um, you know particularly useful in different trade dynamics uh, it's a really useful platform there's very interactive tools that if anybody's interested you can go either uh, by species type or intervention type. Um, and uh, so I'll put the, the link in there, but I'm sure our colleague uh, from Homeland Security has some more to add to, to mine. Thanks. Yes, thanks. DP. All right, thanks, Julian. Uh, generally, if we, I'm looking at it from the South African perspective. Uh, your level one, your poachers, your individuals and groups, and your level two, your local receivers are the ones that are being intercepted and arrested on the sting operations. Uh, the national buyers, exporters, and international receivers, your level three, four, and five are not being identified. On one occasion uh, during the course of last year, we identified a national buyer, uh, and we had information that he had three dead pangolins. Uh, the data the information that we had was excellent. And when we uh, got the D director of Priority Crimes of Investigation to search his property, unfortunately, the pangolins or the scales or the meat were, was not found. So it's really difficult when you are addressing your level three, four, and five in uh, your national buyers, exporters, and international receivers. Uh, the pol police on the ground are usually get, uh, arresting your level one and level two, and you need to see the bigger picture and identify these exporters and conduct long-term projects, as, as you call it, so long-term investigations to identify your larger network, uh, both locally as well as internationally. And this is going to take some time and just not overnight success with your sting operations. Great, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else on the panel would like to comment. Um, I'm just also wondering if there are any questions from the audience. We've had a few in the chat box, but is there anyone who would like to raise a particular question at this point? Um, stick your hand up and we can unmute you um, as you're scrolling through. Awfully quiet today. Maybe while you're scrolling through, Julian, I could just comment further yes. on, uh, on law enforcement through Africa. Um, Alexis Krill is on this platform with us today. She's um, in charge of special projects on my board. And mm. we went up to Nigeria um, last year, February, just prior to the outbreak of the pandemic globally. And we met with all the big shots in Nigeria. And as um, Nick pointed out just now, Nigeria is a huge transit hub, probably responsible for more than 60, probably closer to 70% of all the hang mm. scales out of the continent. And we met with previous president, President Odesanya. We've met with customs officials, um, police officials, army officials, um, what they call vigilante police. It's quite a strange place because they, they've got um, civilians that carry AKs and mm. <laughs> anyway. Um, and they were dead keen to help us. You know, they really were keen. But um, to comment on law enforcement throughout Pangolin range states, that's those countries where their pangolins exist there is suitable law gazetted in place. The problem is it's not being enforced. And one of the reasons it's not being enforced is also culturally they've been utilizing pangolins for hundreds if not thousands of years. Police chaps eat pangolins uh, up in the Gulf of Guinea. Army chaps do, tribal chiefs do. Um, so modern Western law 
doesn't take preference over cultural belief systems and the um, to implement this law is simply not happening and also corruption is absolutely huge right. so there are a number of, of of faceted approaches that that need to be taken um, to, to address not only the local use but the in, now uh, in more recent terms the international trade in pangolins that they actually worth more for their skills than they were culturally for their meat we also need to take note that pangolins Historically, because I've published three papers on the harvesting of pangolins up in West Africa, um, the harvest was not unsustainable. It was reasonably sustainable. That's the natural harvest for people, local people. Now, the harvest for international trade is far exceeding that, and that is the direct threat to Africa's pangolins. Great. Uh, Nick, I saw you raise your hand there. Yeah, thanks. It just uh, made me think of some additional things that might be of interest. We were talking before about the role of China and Hong mentioned uh, the need to focus on diaspora communities as well. And that's certainly something that's been on, on our radar as well. In the last few years, I've been doing comparative studies in East Africa involving the um, same uh, we call it the wildlife use pattern study, but a, a comparative analysis of use of of by Chinese diaspora communities living in, in East Africa compared to local uh, use and, and, and also analyzing the, the, the motivations for, for the different use types. And you know, the, the results were, uh, were fascinating in the, 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 the breadth and the variety of species that were being consumed um, at, admittedly or you know, either indirectly knowing of somebody who consumes um, these types of products. Uh, but by far, the, the emphasis really showed that the, you know, the, the, the importance of engaging the, the Chinese uh, communities, but the, it's more of the perception of local communities about the potential market demand by, uh, by the presence of, of Chinese communities. And that's where a lot of the emphasis um, needs to, to go in terms of there, it's just this inherent belief that there will be a market because the, 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 the Chinese have a presence there and there's a demand for it, even if that's completely false. But also the perception of the illegality and the legislative uh, protections of, of these species were far superior with Chinese diaspora communities in the host countries than the, the local communities themselves. Um, and just touching on Ray's point, I think that you know that, that combination. We, we're really looking more at source side uh, demand reduction work, applying the same kind of psychology and things that we've learned from the Asia side on on, on local communities and the and the and the dynamics that exist between those you know perceptions of markets. Um, so that's something to to stay tuned for. We're, we we under the extension phase of trust that I was mentioning. There's a, a whole program of behavior change research that's going to uh, convert into pilot uh, projects looking exactly at this type of dynamic in Central and East Africa as well as in Asia too. So there should be some interesting findings uh, to share from that too. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. I think, I mean, I think the Nigeria question is also an interesting one as in why it emerged. Um, you know, Nigeria has long been a hub for a range of illicit commodities. And I think what's quite interesting is some of the seizures that we've been seeing, you're seeing a mix of, of products. You're seeing large quantities of pangolin scales, but also with lion bones, for instance, or with, um, with um, ivory. Um, we've seen in other instances where there's convergence between other types of, of crime and the illegal wildlife trade, where you'll have um, you know, wildlife products being shipped, but potentially mixed in with some quantities of narcotics or that kind of thing. Um, you know, I. I think the, the hub, it's in some ways, I guess it's also around who controls access to those hubs. Um, you know, you see the same ports coming up time and time again in seizures um, around the continent. Um, and very much, you know, there's potentially this network of facilitators or of, of gatekeepers for want of a better description who allow a range of illicit commodities through those ports, um, who are paid off who form a sort of corrupt chain. Um, and obviously high levels of, of corruption, high levels of poverty, um, you know, that seems to be the, the perennial problem. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any observations around that, you know, the emergence of these hubs, the sort of um, the crossover between different types of wildlife trade, potentially crossover between, 
um, between other types of organized crime and, and the pangolin trade. I'm not sure if there, there are specific cases that I, I can't think of any right now, but yeah. Right, that seems to have killed the discussion completely. I will um, stop babbling there. Um, I, I did see, by the way, that I, I apparently Craig had a much nicer photograph for us, which I completely sidestepped. So I don't know, Craig, if you, if Belinda wants to just put that up and Craig, if you want to talk us through that, sorry about that. Just moving back to a bit more positivity, some light in the midst of darkness. <laughs> oh, wow. No, no problem. Yeah, I think uh, there's been a lot of uh, <laughs> we, we've seen a lot of the bad side of things, but um, uh, I do I do truly believe that there is there is still a way out for these creatures. Um, if you look in, in the early two thousands, black rhino uh, black rhino numbers were estimated around two thousand three hundred, two thousand four hundred left, and and through a lot of a lot of efforts um, in both the public and private sector. Um, and, and importantly, in my opinion, raising the profile uh, of these animals as charismatic species. You know, black rhino numbers are now around 6,000. Um, and, and so that, that's from an animal that was kind of deemed to be on the brink of extinction. And, and through, through a lot of human or hard work by a lot of dedicated people, um, you know, that, that trend is going in the right direction. And uh, I think kind of uh, just to come back on something that Hong Zhang brought up, you know, the, the example of, of the man who used to eat pangolin and, and thought they were delicious. But then when, when he had the opportunity to understand a little bit about them, you know, his perceptions have changed completely. And mm. uh, I, think, I think having events like this and involving the media and journalists and trying to get the message out there is, is going to be our, our biggest tool in, in this fight. Because as soon as we can get more and more people talking about this and understanding the more resources we can get into projects like we're trying to do here at and beyond Pinda. And, and, and I believe we've been successful so far. It's been only two years, but we, we need to get people to, to buy in and, and to try and do the same thing elsewhere because, you know, what's a small population of, let's say, for example, 20, 30 pangolin when, when we're losing what 200,000 uh, every, every year or whatever that number is. But, but if we can get everyone involved, then, then I really think that, that we can still reverse this thing, but anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Mm. <laughs> this is a, this is this is kind of the epitome of the success story that that we've seen here, and and we've we've released a good few now, and um, we, we've learned so much from from all of them. They've all got their unique personalities, and and we've had different hurdles with each of them. But you know, this is a female that that arrived, and and she she settled in really really well. And uh, we noticed a weight drop in one of our in one of our weighings, and uh, we went and put up a camera trap at, at her burrow, and uh, and we noticed that she she had given birth to a, a pup, and um and and for for me this is the the first sign that that we're kind of creating a a, a viable wild population of Temix pangolin in an area where they'd previously been locally extinct, and so although we've got all of these challenges, and and there's so many. So many hurdles to overcome. Um, yeah. I do think that that this is kind of a great example that it, that it is possible, and um, and if we can tell the story to as many people as we can, uh, the more the more and more buy-in we can get. Yeah, absolutely. And I think no, I think you weren't getting sidetracked there. I think it's a very important and a point to make because we we do you know sometimes find ourselves sort of confronted with this massive devastation. You know. Um, uncountable sort of pangolins being slaughtered and traded or rhinos being poached or whatever. And it's, it's very easy to, you know, throw your hands in the air and say, look, it's all over. What do we do? Um, whereas I think, you know, in some ways, and we've seen this before, you know, throughout the course of human history, where we've been able to rise to these challenges and not, you know, necessarily hundreds of thousands of people, but a small group of people who are dedicated, you know, the, the, um, the story of the, of the, the white rhino in South Africa uh, in the 1960s is a prime example of how you know a small dedicated group of people really made a significant change. Um, so I think there's I think there's a lot that can be done there. Um, I mean, there's an interesting question here from from Liza Lisa Smith, um, which I think goes to the heart. You know, this is a media roundtable, and I was wondering if any you know if any of the people on the on the in the room might want to comment. 
but what sort of role do we think that the media could play, um, you know, beyond creating awareness? Um, you know, I, I, for one, come back, come from very much a, an investigative journalism background. Um, for me, it was very much about trying to, to look in depth at how syndicates operate, what's driving them, what are the motivations for poachers, um, trying to follow the, the, the chain of, of the syndicate operating across borders from Africa through into Asia. Um, but, you know, I think, I think there is a, a lot of questioning that could go on about, you know, um, because the media have a very powerful and very unique role that, that could be played here. And I think the difficulty that we have in places like South Africa, but also in, in many of the other countries, is that your traditional media, your, your uh, traditional newspapers are in decline. Um, media houses are shutting down. We've had you know, enormously distressing figures this week um, of um, you know, print figures and, and um, uh, circulation figures for most of the major dailies in South Africa. Um, but we're also seeing new media initiatives um, uh, that are developing. Um, I see Fiona McLeod's on here from Oxpeckers, so that's an example. Um, we've seen, you know, NGO-funded investigations units like Becky Sisa, um, which reports on health being started, or uh, Amar Bungani, which has been doing amazing work here. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think that there's there's really a role for kind of a new um, you know, this new growth in, in media to, to play a particular role. And then also the development of, you know, we, one of the things that's missing in traditional media houses in many cases is specialist skills, you know, that institutional knowledge um, that would exist when you had dedicated environmental reporters, people, beat reporters who understood their, um, understood the work that they were doing. Many of those, are, you know, people have retired or, or disappeared. So I think, you know, I think there are areas of concern there. Um, Corinne, I think you had your hand up and wanted to make a quick comment there. Uh, yes, um, from my side, I know I'm not directly involved in all the trade figures and everything, mm -hmm. but I feel that people are are sort of tired of hearing all these bad things. I know it's mm. important, but I do think more success stories have to be told and. And and it's I know this is such a buzzword, but grassroots education, you know, going into communities that live next to the the Kruger Park, like Bushbuck Ridge, kids there don't know really about caring for wildlife. They may just live from one meal to the next, um, and and getting kids involved because my children tell everybody about penguins and how important they are. And most of the kids in their class and their teachers have never heard about it. So I think like an education type program and not in just in um, in the media but maybe the media can help with this in schools and and and, and really um poor demographics in our country where actually most of these pangolins come from and i think if we teach children and communities to want to save things that are in their community they might want to keep um foreign uh, people coming in and trying to take what is theirs and their um their heritage almost um, in a more positive way, you know, people always talk about the war on this and the war on drugs and the war on this, but I, I'm not sure it works if you yell at people doing things. If you, <laughs> and, and I think that's what um, Han said, you know, educating and engaging with people and how they see things and maybe making it more um, visible for them in their communities um, and how to, to report wildlife crime. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the war on drugs has been a great success, as we as we all know. Um, <laughs> I think it's very, very difficult to kind of couch these things in terms of a war. And I think it's overly simplistic, um, particularly, you know, if you look at the rhino situation, even though there are rangers on the ground, it's a lot more nuanced, and a lot deeper than that. Um, um, but yeah, I think I think that, you know, at least in my, my limited experience, and there have been some studies done where readers are switched off by being subjected to, you know, constant violent images. We've seen that, for instance, of rhino poaching, where at one stage, you know, every person who was campaigning on the issue, and I'm, I'm at fault myself, was showing off these particularly gruesome, grotesque images, trying to shock people into, hmm. into some, you know, semblance of, oh, my God, we need to do something. And very often the reaction is the opposite. People shut down. They, hmm. you know, they don't want to engage with those images because they are so distressing. 
Um, so it's about trying to do that and finding ways of, of telling these these particular stories. Um, Ray, you've got your, your hands up there. Can I just say one thing before Ray carries yes, on? If you yes. look, uh, our, our Facebook page, for instance, um, the Johannesburg Wildlife Vet, I mean, we treat small and medium indigenous wildlife. We'd say anything from doves and bats to snakes and eagles and caracal. We find that people respond best to the happy stories. You know, we used to say, um, just share mammal stories because people are often not so much enamored with, with reptiles. But one of our biggest stories was of a bullfrog we saved and fixed its leg and released again. It was massive. Mm. And people love that kind of thing. Thanks, Ray. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's, that's true. <laughs> Ray. Yeah, I, I, thanks, Julian. I completely agree with doc, what Dr. K said. And, you know, if we look at our social media platforms, there are a lot more... Um, engagement with good news stories and less so because there's a lot of fatigue not just with rhino poaching but just with the bloody pandemic you know <laughs> it's just mm. people yeah. are tired of, of bad news um and what karine said about communities is grassroots education and awareness is absolutely critical and, and we're really going to put huge efforts into taking that forward from now on um but coming back to the importance of media if not every single case of an intelligence operation came from a member of public. And that member of public had learned pangolins and what they look like and that they're in trouble from media. Uh -huh. And media is a massively important weapon to reverse this trade. Um, even if it's a good news story, a person now sees what a pangolin is, they know it's endangered, they don't have to show horrible images and grotesque images. And we've got lots of those, believe me. Uh -huh. um, but the awareness out there from the public feeds directly back into law enforcement, back into us, back into everybody on this journey, the hospital, Punda. Um, it's a huge network of amazing organizations and people that, that rely from the onset from media. But media can also play an increasingly destructive role. And here I'm going to single out the South African police service. So I'm going to get phone calls from brigadiers just now, but I'm going to do it anyway. You cannot post the price of these animals. You, you mm, simply yeah. can't do it. You can't do it for rhino, you can't do it for ivory, you can't do it for palamon, and you most certainly cannot do it for, for pangolins of how much they weigh, how much they're worth per gram, how much they uh, you receive for them in China. That is completely fueling the trade. And we need to put an immediate stop to that because if we take that away, we take away the demand. So mm. media have got a, a, a massively important role, but it can also play quite a destructive role. And it's not so much the, um, the, the, the South African media out there. It's, of, it's many times um, media statements from, from government organizations, actually, such as the South mm. African Police Service. Mm. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a personal bugbear of mine too. We had a massive seizure of rhino horn recently at our timber and the, the black market value that was put under by a government agency was extraordinary um, and yes, had zero that. foundation in reality. Um, yes, I saw that. So, so I think a lot of those figures are thumb suck. We, we see that a lot with, with drug seizures too, where black market prices do not equate with the people that we're interviewing on the ground who are actually involved in the trade. Um, so yeah, that's actually a good point. There's a, a question here. We're nearing the, the end of this discussion. Um, but uh, Nika Richards uh, was saying, you know, with pangolin population numbers being so difficult to quantify, how do we know how long we have left to save them? And are there any conservative estimates? Was this a guesstimate? Maybe if I can come in there again, Julian. Um, so as part of the IUCN and also um, the Endangered Wildlife Trust and the red data analysis for the South African government, I sit on these panels and it's, it's very difficult it's not so much of a thumb suck. We look at uh, figures of a number of individuals in the trade. We also have a public sightings database that comes in, um, not only to our organizations, but other nonprofit organizations and other government organizations. So frequency of observations um, and, and communities when last they see pangolins. So we can't give exact quantified numbers, but we can give reliable estimates and these are published um, by organizations such as the IUCN Red List uh, 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 Species List, as well as the um, South African Endangered Species, Species List. So 
they are reasonably accurate, I would say, uh, give or take a variance of about 10 to 12 percent each way. Um, so there are mechanisms to determine population estimates of ghosts. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right. Uh, I wonder if there are any other questions from the floor. Um, while we're at that, we had a We've had a couple of minor technological mishaps, and I know Corinne was keen to show us a couple of photos, which are so nice, they almost destroyed Zoom, um, which I'm sure many of us would probably like one day, is never to do another Zoom call. Um, okay. Corinne, can you maybe get it up there? Uh, Linda, Linda, can you do the first one, perhaps, and I'll do the second one? Okay. Oh, wow, it oh. worked. <laughs> So with the media people, um, this is what we mean with a feel-good story. Uh, Craig knows her, Ray knows this pangolin. Um, this was a, pa a pup that was born in our hospital. The female, her name was Tata. Um, she came in pregnant and she, when she had the pup, she was really too ill to care for it. Um, and she was with us for quite a couple of months. Um, and Tot, we had to raise, uh, we had to hand raise. And Nikki, my partner in the hospital, she's the rehab specialist. Um, she took care of, of Tot. And this was taken when she was a month old. Um, oh no, I'm lying, a week old. She just fit into the palm of Nikki's hand. And I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, so I know, wait. Um, is it sharing? Is it showing? Okay. And this is what the we named the pangolin pup Tot. And this is Tot today. Uh, well, it's actually a month um, ago, but this is Tot now after she's being, she's on a special milk formula. Uh, Nikki has started taking her out to feed. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's such a journey and we learn from them so much, you know, things that happen on their tongue structures. Um, the first time Tot was actually able to recognize what an ant is and eat it. And then her food bit her, which was super scary for her. Um, and her reaction to that, it was absolutely fascinating. And, um, um, and how do I stop sharing now? You could just leave that photo yeah. up there. It's okay, the, oh, I'll put the other one up again, sorry. <laughs> um, so for us to learn from her, and you, you, we have videos of her digging for the first time, you know, something in her brain tell her, tells her, I must dig. She has no idea why, but her, you know, her, her whole DNA is about ants and eating ants. And I think telling stories like that, um, when people are so tired of hearing bad news stories. I know it's just one, and I know it's just one baby, but it starts with one. And if we can get one person to go, oh my, that's a cute picture. Oh, this is a cute animal. I really like it. I want to save it, like you do with lions and pandas and elephants. People like those things. But um, often people see pangolins as these scaly things that look a little bit like a reptile. You know, they look cold and horrible. But when you see that, you know, it's a mammal. It, it needs saving, and it and, and wants... Um, you know, it needs attention like any other mammal does. Um, so, you know, it suckles from its mother. It needs bottle feeding, which is hilarious with a tongue coming out half the time. You know, things like that, I think, to get kids and people to, to come on board and to help rather than having a picture of a half dead pangolin or being fried on the side of the road in, in Nigeria. I believe that's my opinion that, that we can do a lot more with happy images than sad images. Right, it's a good night to reach that there. Yeah, it's absolutely stunning photograph that. Um, I just wanted to, and there's another point that's been made here is that, you know, there needs to be development of alternative livelihoods, alternative livelihoods approaches for hunters, poachers. Um, again, that's something that you come across a lot, you know, in doing research in places like Cameroon, where, you know, this the trade in pangolins is tied to people's livelihoods. But I guess, you know, a question I'd like to throw out, and this, I'm throwing it out to the panel as a whole, um, feel free to jump in. And it's it's one of those lovely open-ended questions that we like to end things on is, where do we go from here? How do we how do we actually deal with this? And what sort of future do you foresee? Um, you know, what what approaches do you think we should be adopting? How do we how do we confront something that is so massive and so extraordinary and you know, is is you know one one threat among so many? 
Nick's nodding his head. I'm going to volunteer, Nick. Also because you sat across from me in a tiny office that didn't have an office. Oh, I'm, I miss your mug, Julian, every day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, well, I think part of it is just to, to go back to, I mean, obviously the problem is massive. And I, I think some of the ways that it helps us in, in understanding is, you know, you kind of make it as relatable as you can from an evidence perspective. And a lot of the consumer side, you know, there's like we were saying, there, there are so many different elements to it. And some of the more successful approaches we've had with other species types, uh, including rhino or most more recently in Vietnam is really uh, creating profiles for, for the user um, and use type to, to create really robust and evidence-based campaigns to, to hit uh, the nail on the head with what triggers the, you know, the, the point at which somebody, and we all do it in our lives, change our behavior for one reason or another because of that turning point that uh, makes us, maybe it's something that's a message that you get beaten into your head over a, a longer period of time. And sometimes it's instant where you just say, no, nah, you know, but there, but there are, uh, we're way farther along, you know, from a, from a, as a collective community about um, those types of knowledge bases. And um, so I think that would be uh, the way to go. I mean, we, we know why the trade exists um, and it's for, for these reasons. And there, therefore that's an important part. Having said that, there's so many advancements along the trade chain. I mean, the difficulty in doing law enforcement um, is, you know, as we've said, but you know we've invested a lot in different technologies and um, Trace, for example, is again a partner on Bucanal and, and ourselves over the years have uh, created a reference sample libraries of of, uh, of all penguin species as well as you know dozens of other commonly traded species where we've mapped out the the mitochondrial genome to be able to use for different uses, including species ID and provenance testing and, and parentage and so forth. And this, you know, it, 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 it's another tool that can help people to uh, um, identify, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a seizure of 29 tons, for example, what composition this is, where did it come from, uh, source populations, um, you know, and that, that's a, an important piece of the puzzle to, to know which countries are involved and how to engage them. Um, so yeah, that, those are a couple ideas for myself. Uh, anyone else or should I randomly pick victims? It's what my boss does during Zoom calls. Someone had a hand up there. Oh, DP, yes, thank you. Hi, Julian. I think political will across uh, countries, continents and borders uh, to address uh, this uh, trafficking of pangolins and wildlife globally. Also imposing severe sentences and fines and having multi-dimensional teams that can help to conserve the pangolin species. It takes a network to defeat a network. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks, TP. Um, anyone else on, I mean, even on a smaller scale, you know, how do we deal with this one-on-one -on -one in the work that we're doing? I mean, you know, you've got Craig, Karen, Ray, who are doing a lot of work and trying to rehabilitate on the, on the other end of the spectrum. Then we have people working on the law enforcement side. Any observations from you? Craig. Um, from my side, uh, I can only really speak from, from the sort of Zululand, Northern KwaZulu-Natal perspective. And, and I think it was quite unique in this case where, where Temex pangolin became locally extinct. And so with that, uh, in terms of the changes of beliefs and, 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 and so forth, uh, the Infanyezi, which is the Zulu, Zulu word for, for pangolin in this area. And when we did a, a lot of surveys prior to, to the kickoff of this project, because obviously the poaching again of these rewilded animals was, was of, of great concern. Mm -hmm. And um, very interestingly, um, because they've been uh, locally extinct or, or in, in such low numbers in, in this part of KwaZulu Natal for so long, it seems like the, the, the historical beliefs that, that caused them to be poached in this area had kind of been forgotten um, through time, which, 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 is, which was really good for us at a, at a very local level. But I, I think we've really got to hope that that's not the case elsewhere because, because obviously that would be very, very detrimental. But it, it was just an interesting point to note is that, you know, mm -hmm. in, in 
20 years, something that where, where previously, and, and Ray, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to give an infanyezi, to give a, a pangolin to, to the chief or the nkosi um, of, of our local uh, tribes was, was one of the highest gifts you could bestow and it would automatically increase your, your sort of social standing. And uh, within a short period of time, um, because, of, because of these sort of things, as well as the electric fences and, and so on, um, uh, those beliefs have kind of have been, been forgotten um, and, and are not part of, of the culture in this area. So if there's lessons to learn from that, I mean, I think we, we kind of are a small group of people who, who have kind of passed that and we're now from the local extinction trying to you know, start from the ground up again. If, if there's lessons that can be learned from that and examples that can be made from that and taken and, and either replicated or prevented in, in other parts of the world uh, with other species of pangolin, then that's great. Uh, we, do we have the solutions? <laughs> no, we don't. But I no. think as, as we can talk about these things and, and learn from each independent case study, hopefully we'll, we'll come up with them in the near future. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. Um, anyone else want to come in there? Maybe I can add a little bit, yes. like the, the China side. So uh, I think it would be great if we can spend more effort to engage the Chinese communities in Africa, including in South, South Africa, for them to understand more about pangolin and to care more about them. Uh, because first, they actually, based on our experience, like Chinese communities in Africa, they actually have a lot of intelligence and information regarding the trade and the traffickers and so on. And if they can cooperate with the intelligence and so on, they may be able to help quite a lot. And a lot of them would be very helpful if they can help some of the in law enforcement agency regarding investigation and so on. Second, uh, a lot of the Chinese business and the Chinese uh, companies and so on in Africa, they would be able to provide some kind of like, I would say new money regarding like pangolin conservation and so on. And lastly, but I actually would say would, would be the most important thing. I think if we can, I think it's much easier to engage Chinese in Africa regarding pangolin conservation compared to Chinese in China because they are closer and they, they have this environment and for a lot of them, pangolin is not something that is too far away for them compared to Chinese in China. So if we can engage them, they will be the great ambassadors to bring this message back and influence Chinese people inside China. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Hong. Um, at that point, I think I'm going to, to close off and hand back to Belinda. Just two points that have come up in the chat. Um, Alexa saying that the media are not focused enough on the reasons um, for virus pandemics. I think there's been some, some really exceptional reporting around the, the origins of zoonoses and health pandemics. But I, I do fear that we'll get through this, we'll hit a point where we're vaccinated and the world will return to normal. And the lessons that we've learned from this pandemic will be forgotten until we get hit by the next big one, which is what most science scientists working on are expecting, that this is just the, the test run for something far, far worse and far more catastrophic uh, unless things change. And then also, you know, a call for from Geo Smith talking about, um, you know, medical research being done into the effectiveness of, of pangolin scales in TCM, um, something that, that's possible to consider. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a great privilege to be on this, on this panel and over to Belinda. Thanks, Julian. And thank you so much to all of our incredible panel members and to everyone who chatted in their questions and who participated in what I think we can all agree was a really fascinating and insightful conversation. So thank you. I really appreciate that. We have, however, run out of time now, so I will need to bring this to a close. If you have any questions that we haven't answered or if you think of anything after this session, please feel free to get hold of me. Um, my email address is up on the screen right now. You can drop me a line and I will pass it on to the relevant person. Um, and then also just a final punt uh, for anyone who may be interested in finding out more about the work being done at and beyond, which Craig has obviously alluded to in his comments today. You can also join them for a wonderful discussion this Thursday, the 18th of February at four o'clock, also Central African time. They'll be live on their Facebook and YouTube channels, which are also there on the screen. Otherwise, I'm sure you can just type them into the search on those platforms. Um, and they'll be chatting to four conservationists who have provided the safe and expert hands needed to take a pangolin from rescue to release. 
so I'm sure that will be one to look forward to on Thursday as well. So just in closing to say thank you once again to everyone for joining, um, particularly to Rebecca Kashivda, our USAID Southern Africa Acting Mission Director for giving of her time to open the event. And then again, a very special thanks to all of our panel members and our facilitator for making this event possible and for sharing your incredible work with us. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you again and goodbye.